I'd like to call to order the uh, meeting of the Whaley Select Board on November 18th, 2020. First agenda item is uh, meeting minutes of October 28th, 2020. Any comments, discussion on the minutes? No. Nope. Uh, none for me. Okay, motion to approve minutes. Motion. I would make a uh, second. Okay, roll call vote, Jonathan. Yeah. Joyce. Yes. Okay, minutes approved. Uh, vendor and payroll warrants, uh, they were in our uh, information received before the meeting. Any comments, discussion? Not on my end. No, look uh, okay. Me. Yeah, they're fine. Okay, moving on. Uh, Public comments. Uh, anybody have any comments on items that are not on our agenda for this evening? Okay, Mark. Yep, Mark Zabolski. Um, I'm here with my wife Melissa and my sister, uh, owners of 13 LaSalle Drive. Um, we understand that the proposal um, for 23 LaSalle Drive is being discussed today. Um, and just wanted to see, we have public comments on that and just want to see if we should address those now or if we should wait until um, after the folks from Canada Select have had the opportunity to present. Uh, let's see where we have that on our agenda here. One of the first uh, items, it's one of the first items, Fred. 4A, first appointment. 4A. Uh, Okay, well, it, in just a minute, Mark, uh, we'll, we'll get to that item uh, where you can, you can uh, discuss your comments. Uh, other than for that item, does anybody else have any public comments? Right, we just, we received, uh, the board received one email from Dan Dennehy um, and that was included in your packet. And that was in regards to, um, Wondering if the board would invite Chris Collins to join the next select board meeting to talk about, um, I guess what's what's going on with FCAT in terms of posting videos and the idea of a of a Waitley Facebook page. Um, that was the the really the extent of the comments or a summary of the comments at least. Okay, so have you done anything with that? I have not. Nope. Okay. I don't know. Can I have a comment on the comment? <laughs> I, I actually think it's probably um, uh, overdue to, for us to have a conversation with Chris about um, about FCAT and uh, what they're doing for Waitley and how they're doing with their operations. I, I think we haven't checked in with them to find out um, how they're managing. And um, I think uh, that would be a, a good thing. I don't know if this is uh, urgent enough to do in the next two weeks or our next meeting, or if it would be the meeting after that. But um, I think we should have a conversation with Chris. I think that'd be a healthy thing. Uh, Joyce, Joyce, you're breaking up. We didn't hear your, all your comments. <clears throat> Sorry, I think it would be a good idea to have a meeting with Chris. Um, we don't have to leave it to just the topics. I'm getting feedback here too, so I don't know if it's- somebody... It's from Keith, now it's gone. Okay. Um, both are muted. So, okay, great. <laughs> um, I think it would be really healthy for us to have a conversation with Chris, uh, not just about the items that, um, that Dan brought up, but we haven't talked to him in a while about how operations are going there um, and uh, kind of even sustainability and uh, those sorts of things. So uh, I think we should, we should ask him to come in. I don't know if it's urgent enough to do in our first December meeting or second December meeting, but um, somewhere in the short horizon, I think it'd be good to have a talk with them. Okay, sounds good. So Brian will coordinate with him and, and see which of the next meetings uh, will be appropriate for him to come and talk to us. Can, right. Contingent, obviously, on how many meetings we, we have in December. <clears throat> we'll discuss right. that later, I'm sure. All right. Cool. Okay, any other public comments for items not on the agenda? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Uh, we've got a few scheduled appointments here this evening. The first is on 
from Sophia Litza of the uh, representing Whaley RE Holding LLC discuss uh, preliminary discussions with the select board on a proposed marijuana cultivation establishment on LaSalle Drive and to request permission to hold a virtual community outreach meeting. Yep. Good evening for the record. Sophia Bitsis from R. Lebeck Associates here on behalf of Waitley Real Estate Holdings, LLC. Um, the entity is currently proposing a proposed indoor cultivator establishment to be located at 23A LaSalle Drive. Um, with permission, if I could share my screen, I could do a quick overview of the site plan. Sure, one second. Okay. like I might be all set to go. Do you guys just want to let me know when you guys can see that I can go ahead and get started? Yeah, it's up. Okay, perfect. So um, I am here also with my team, um, Bob and Chris Simony, and also Neil Adak, who is the marijuana consultant, cannabis consultant. And we also have the owner of the property, John LaSalle, um, on the line with us as well. Um, briefly, just to go through the proposed site improvements, um, there are not many. All of the... Um, greenhouses that are proposed to be used for the intel gr um, internal growing are already in existence through the floral shop. Um, there will be minor um, improvements made for security and lighting purposes, um, including a proposed perimeter fence and proposed parking um, over here where you can see my cursor, hopefully. Um, everything else is pretty much going to uh, remain the same as far as the site goes. Um, we are before the select board here to first and foremost provide an update that we have initiated uh, the permitting process with the town of Whateley, having meetings with the planning board and also the ZBA. Um, and we are here seeking permission to hold our community outreach program um, meeting through virtually, so through a Zoom. Um, the Cannabis Control Commission has extensive guidelines in which to follow um, to accommodate that, um, but we would like to ask permission to hold the same. <coughs> Um, at this time, if there are any questions regarded to the site plan, I can go ahead and answer or any preliminary questions um, I can pass along to our cannabis consultant. So you're not, you're not proposing to add greenhouses to the outdoor growing area where they currently, I mean, obviously they, they have a pretty extensive growing area outside of their current greenhouse establishment. Um, yep. what, what would you plan to do there? Yep, currently right now, the only proposal is to um, grow within the existing establishments, um, including Greenhouse 2 would be the first one. Um, Greenhouse 1 would be, I believe, be the second one um, and possibly expanding further as the process um, expands, but there are no proposals um, at this time to add any additional greenhouses. So are you proposing to buy all this property or to lease it? What's the... Uh, I believe the property is going to be purchased. And we have it we have it under contract for purchase with certain contingencies attached to it. Is, is that include the it looks like two buildings outside that fence on a on the bottom of the screen. Yep, that includes the entire site. This site actually um I don't know if I have I might have a better overall view. So here is the entire property. Um, okay. so the proposal is to buy the entire parcel. Including the house including the house. And doesn't that parcel go further to the left beyond that meandering yep. stream? Yep, past the wetlands, yes, yep. Okay. Are, are there any, and again, I don't mean to get ahead of ourselves if, um, <clears throat> are there any um, bylaws or, or environmental um, things written on cultivating marijuana near wetlands? All, all the internal um, growing internally is allowed um, under the, the local ordinance. Regardless of wetlands? Regardless, yep. Include, we do have permitting applications before the uh, planning board and ZBA for the operational pieces of it. Um, but there's nothing that prohibits it where we're proposing it. CONCOM doesn't have to get involved. 
Not that we're aware of, we aren't proposing any work within the buffer zone. Everything's gonna remain as it is. Okay, could you explain a little about what your company is and how established and are you part of a larger corporation or? Um, so I don't know if Neil or Chris or Bob Simony would like to comment to the specifics of the entity. Neil, you want me to do it or do you want to do it? <clears throat> You're on mute, Neil, by the way. Yeah, go, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I forgot that. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, uh, so my father is, is Bob. Um, we met Neil actually through a um, you know, business venture that we were going to do in a different um, different town, actually, um, where, where my father and I own some other property. Um, and that site didn't end up working out. So um, Neil went on a, a search, found the LaSalle farm and built a relationship with John. And we formed a, an entity um, that has, you know, the three of us are, are involved in the operations. We are gonna have some outside equity partners, but, but it's not involved as part of a, a larger corporation or anything like that. This is a newly formed entity and this is our first, um, um, our first project. Um, but again, Neil has extensive uh, knowledge and experience. So I'll let him give a little, little more background on the project. Oh uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Just to, to kind of recap what, what Chris said, when I was looking for land. Um, I, I uh, have a background in the sciences. I uh, originally from Carson City, Nevada. I moved to um, Massachusetts for school and I got a master's degree in, in neuroscience from Harvard. I became particularly interested in cannabis and uh, the medical benefits um, and uh, once, once it became legal, I became interested in, in starting a grow, which is what brought me to uh, Chris and Bob initially because they owned land in Beckett. But then uh, as more interest uh, kind of came in, um, we, uh, I sort of set my sights a little higher uh, because there was more, more backing from uh, the additional partners. So we were able to go uh, 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 get the uh, you know, uh, arrangement with with John in place for the, the purchase of the farm. And um, so that's, that's about that. And then uh, I can tell you a little bit more about uh, the grow itself and sort of uh, the operations. Um, uh, the most important things are there won't be any runoff at all. Um, we're going to use a 100% closed system where the wastewater is completely filtered and then reused. Um, and there uh, will be a fence that's put around the perimeter, as Sophia said, but no major changes to the site. There will be some improvements like uh, as we go, like painting, you want to paint the barn on the southwest corner, some things like that, that would um, just in general make the whole the appearance uh, uh, nicer and bring the property values up. Um, there won't, another, the other important things are to know or is there won't be any smell at all uh, uh, detectable from outside of the farm. The, uh, Odor filtration is a three-stage odor filtration system where carbon filters are used. Carbon filters continually filter the odorants out of the air within the greenhouse and then within an intermediary chamber. And then once again, they're filtered, the air is filtered upon exit out of an exhaust pipe that's based uh, towards the sky uh, from the end of the greenhouse. Um, uh, and um, just uh, the only other concerns I can think of right now would be um, there won't be any advertising. Like we're not a retail establishment. We won't uh, be doing any manufacturing either. We're strictly cultivation. So the staff would be uh, in the beginning, only five, uh, five or six people in the very beginning. Um, and once we're uh, full up to, to the capacity of this proposal, I predict 10 people at the most would be if sufficient to run operations on the farm. We have uh, enough parking currently for that many people. Um, and uh, and so uh, naturally, because it's not a retail, you don't have to worry about the public coming. There won't be any advertisements. This will be as low key of an operation as possible. Okay, now I'd like to open the floor to questions. 
Okay, before we move on, I know Mark has some questions. I'd just like to hear from Mr. LaSalle, what his comments, if you have any comments you wanted to share before we get into other comments. John, are you there? Uh, no, we can't, we can't hear you, John. I can hear you, if you don't say. I can't hear him, does anybody hear him? He's gonna come upstairs and share my video. Hang on one second. While he's coming, while he's coming up, would you be building um, loading dock facilities? Uh, there's actually already uh, there. There, there are overhead doors existing on the property that are going to remain as far as um, transporting the the materials into delivery vans. Okay. It's already enclosed and already there. Okay. <clears throat> are there, um, is it okay to ask a question too? Um, are the um, there's some fields out there, one kind of closer to LaSalle Drive, and then the others on the other side of the greenhouse. Um, what are the plans for those fields? Uh, nothing is proposed at this time as far as improvements um, to the field at a later state. Um, there may be additional permitting requested um, for expansion, but at the time, it's it's not proposed. I mean, what what's going to happen? They're not just going to sit there and grow weeds. Um, there must be some plan for maintaining them or. I would love to see flowers still growing there, but that's, I, I, I'm not the owner, so. Hi, this is John. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now, folks? Yes. Yes. Okay. The, the front field on the corner of Claverack Road will still be growing space for either flowers or vegetables, depending on, on uh, what they plan on doing. My house that I presently live in now will be sold along with the property and will remain as a residence. The uh, fields in the back will be maintained uh, for uh, whatever use is permissible uh, according to the bylaws of the state. Um, the greenhouse, the, the main thing that I like about this project is that the greenhouses will remain as greenhouses and will be refurbished and uh, kept up uh, as now they're in need of maintenance, which I can't afford to do. And so with these people purchasing the property, it will uh, enhance uh, enhance the greenhouses and, and put them in their proper use. So. Okay. 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 Hey, hey, Fred, can I ask a uh, couple questions? Sure. Um, in terms of the size of the facility, what are you applying for for a license? Which tier are you applying for? Uh, at first, we're going to apply for uh, a 5,000 square foot tier one grow when we just fill one of the greenhouses. Um, and then we will progressively scale up as needed as we fill more greenhouses. So it's been the practice of, of this select board to, to identify what tier of the facility that's being um, permitted in the host community agreement. So that's, I guess that's something to consider. Um, how big do you think you would go? What's the maximum size, do you think? The maximum size at the well, for what we're proposing today would be uh, tier uh, two twenty or tier three the uh, twenty thousand square foot row. So that's using um, all of the available greenhouse space. Gets that's you to right. Three. That's right. The, the the available greenhouse space is uh, approximately uh, ten to fifteen thousand square feet. We, and um, we, we may have some vertical systems, which the CCC will have an adjustment for that, but uh, I, I predict that it'll be within the 20,000 square foot. And then also, um, so there's, how many residents are there in, in proximity to the, to, the, to the greenhouses and do you know the distances from, from the greenhouses to those houses? Um, yeah. Uh I do have a plan if, um, Brian, if I could um, get um, sharing yep. information again, I can show you. I don't have the distances, but it does show the residences in the vicinity. So if you guys can see the screen, the Locust pro um, property is this hatched area here. Um, there's the farm field in the front here that was just referenced to by Mr. LaSalle. And then yeah. there are residences um, here and here, uh, 47 and 41. And then there's resident 145 up here. 
Um, and then I believe um, there are some individuals from number 13, which is right here. Okay. So those, so there's two of them that are in fairly close proximity. Yes. Where your cursor is now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey, Brian, can I ask you a question? Uh, in our um, process here, would you recommend going with the largest size that we expect to get to versus starting off with the, if we're doing smaller increments, just go for the you know, future potential, what we're going to get to, or start with the smaller one? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if the board has a preference, um, but it, it, it would be up to them. Okay. Um, if they kept their, their, uh, the same pattern in terms of the host community agreements, then, then each time you want to take up a tier, you would need to come back okay. and have discussions okay. with the board and <clears throat> sign. Sorry. My question would be, do you, have, do you have relationships already um, with retailers where your business model is pretty clearly laid out that, that you're going to increase capacity pretty quickly because of those existing relationships? Uh, we'll be doing client acquisition during the licensing process. Okay. But nobody in, in, in mind right now. Uh, yeah, we have several, you know, the area where my father lives in the, in the field area, there's several, several spots around there that we've had general discussions with on just capacity and need, um, but no specific, you know, arrangements for um, sales or anything like that. But we continue to build relationships and market during the licensing process. Okay, let's, let's go back to, uh, I've been holding off and I think Mark is anxious to, to speak here. I didn't mean to put you off, uh, Mark, but we did receive the letter that you sent and I guess on behalf of your family and a few other people, uh, the letter you sent to the select board and I think to Brian and Domina, uh, we appreciate your, your comments, your concerns in there. We, we did get it, we did read it. so. I guess at this time I like to open the, the meeting up to, to, to you to what comments, what, whatever you want to say. Uh, your, if your family's on, uh, I guess they're willing to, to comment as well. So thanks, Fred. I, I, I appreciate that. Like I said, I'm, my sister's here, um, Christine Gordon, and my wife, Melissa, too. So, um, and I, I won't reiterate, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a few highlights, you know, on, you know, based on the letter I submitted earlier. But, um, Basically, uh, my parents currently live at 13 LaSalle Drive, uh, and this property has been in our family for over 55 years. Um, we come from a very proud farming legacy in town. My grandparents and great-grandparents farmed land throughout Waitley, and also my grandfather farmed land in Sunderland. So uh, we definitely understand the opportunity uh, the Pioneer Valley provides for agriculture of all kinds. Uh, we've also been very good friends and neighbors with the LaSalle family uh, ever since we've owned this property, as well as supporting their floral business for many, many years. I mean, weddings, funerals, uh, Mother's Day, you name it. I mean, we've always sort of supported their business. Uh, but we have to say we strongly oppose this business um, as we believe, we do not believe an operation like this uh, belongs in a residential neighborhood. Um, like I said, I've outlined uh, this in a letter uh, that my family and I submitted to the select board as well as a version to the ZBA. But just to, I, to highlight a few key points. Um, really first experience, I mean, based on the backgrounds of the individuals listed in the proposal. I mean, with all due respect, they don't appear to have any real discernible experience in raising cannabis at a commercial level like this. And certainly with the legalization of marijuana, there's been a lot of interest in people getting into this business. And it's really important that the town carefully consider who they're going to allow to come in and open a business like this, uh, particularly given its impact on the community. Um, you know, second, safety. I mean, the proposal has a number of pages, I think 17 pages of security measures including chain link fences, um, security officers, security cameras, panic alarms, uh, bright lights on all, you know, during the night. Um, all of this has really has the visual characteristics. I'm just gonna frankly call it a prison, um, which really destroys the attractiveness of the neighborhood. And I think earlier it was talked about minor improvements that are gonna be made, you know, throughout the property. I mean, the, the, from what's in the proposal seems hardly for minor. Um, you know, and third, odor. I mean, in their 82 page proposal, really only two pages were devoted to odor control. I mean, the greenhouses on the property are very old. One was built, I think more than 80 years ago. And we have serious doubts um, as to whether or not the odor remediation techniques described there could really be adapted to these old greenhouses. 
Um, and finally, property values. I mean, my family and I, we've put a lot of money and time into our property over the years. We've had large scale additions, siding, windows. That's led to increased equity in our home. You know, and with a business like this next door, we feel the potential resale value will be significantly less. So, um, you know, it's our understanding that it's the ZBA that ultimately grants them the special permit to allow them to do this. Uh, we have expressed our concerns to them in writing and will continue to do so. Um, but given this matters on the agenda tonight, we just wanted to express our concerns to you directly on the record. So thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Okay, does anybody else in your family wish to comment? At this time, no. Okay. Just to reiterate uh, the points that my brother made, he said it all and I'm here just as a representative supporting um, the ownership at 13 LaSalle Drive. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Could, you ask, Could I ask to, to uh, I guess, Sophia, to show the, the property layout again. And I guess I'm curious as to the fencing that's going to be around there. And I guess I hear a comment, it's going to be kind of an obtrusive fence in a residential neighborhood. Could you show that to, so we could see again what it's going to look like? And Absolutely. I can definitely, um, with per perfect. Just wanted to make sure I could have permission here. I don't know if you guys can see that though, but this, um, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Sorry, bear with me here one moment. Just want to make sure you guys can see it good. Um, so this is the area here in question. The proposed chain link fence is here um, in the square and hatched area that goes around the perimeter of the greenhouses. Um, there will be cameras placed. Um, I definitely wouldn't categorize it as a, a prison setting. Um, it's typical, you know, chain link fences just for security purposes. I mean, obviously details can be discussed on what type of fencing and screening. Um, the client is open obviously to, to comment and concern from the boards that we are currently before. Uh, everything that has been submitted is pursuant to the special permit criteria that the ZBA has set forth. Um, but obviously our, our clients are willing to, you know, take uh, suggestions um, as far as buffering and screening goes. Um, but the also Cannabis Control Commission has specific guidelines on what needs to be on site um, in order to properly secure the area. So um, the fencing just goes around here, um, as you can see. And if I could just show you the other sheet um, of where 13 is located. 13 is located. Um, over here, which I don't even know if they'll be able to see the fencing from their property. I appreciate it. Okay, but will residents, looks like 41 and 47, will they see the fencing? There is some buffering already here. I was on site last weekend. Um, there is some buffering along here, um, tree buffering, and obviously the structures that are remaining, there's a barn that's currently in existence, um, and the house is here as well. Um, I, I don't know um, specifics on the lighting, but obviously the lighting is going to be proposed to not be intrusive and, and flood over the property areas um, and will be, you know, basically focused on the security of the greenhouses so that the cameras can properly work um, and ensure that there's no encroachments there too, so. Hey. Yeah, I can comment on that too. Most the cameras, uh, the lighting uh, would only be for uh, uh, operational hours during the times when employees would be leaving. Um, there will be no lighting during the night other than um, uh, possibly a very small security light inside. Um, so th th uh, there won't be any lighting issues. Um, the only other light that's going to happen is when we will have lights in the greenhouse. However, um, in, uh, so in the, in the, at dusk, um, that, that light might uh, be visible along with the sunset, but then after the sunset, the light deprivation uh, will have, well, our, our, the greenhouses will be, first of all, I should say, will be sealed and double plastic. So there won't be any smell getting out of those greenhouses. There'll be, there, it doesn't matter that they're old, doesn't matter how old they are, doesn't matter, as long as the frame still stands up, you won't, the, the, the smell can't penetrate two layers of, of Lexan. Um, but, um, over that, there'll be a light deprivation, so uh, an opaque layer that we put up after sunset so that the lights of the greenhouse won't be visible during the night either. So basically we wanna take every, every measure to, to 
you know, make sure that these very legitimate concerns are, that we do everything possible to address those concerns and uh, keep, we want to keep Waitley local residential. I want to, if I could, if I could, I wouldn't change a thing about this farm, but the state re does require us to do certain things and we'll just do the, those things that the state requires us to do so we can operate and keep this farm running. Hey, hey Fred, if yeah. I could make a, a comment and then I have a question for Mark, but my, my first comment, um, you know, I, I've spent a little bit of time buying flowers at LaSalle and you, you definitely will be able to see the fencing from 13. Uh, there, there's no question about that. So I, I just want to make sure that, and, and that that doesn't state my preference for this. It's just in the in, in terms of transparency, you're going to see the fencing from 13. Um, but my question for Mark is, if if you had to prioritize or, or 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 list your concerns in order of concern, from most concern to least concern, what would be your one, two, and three, if you don't mind answering that? Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we kind of outlined them in the letter, uh, Jonathan. I mean, you know, first is sort of the experience of the folks running the facility. Again, I think that, you know, it, it's great that you have a background, but it's never been any sort of um, operation done, you know, on a commercial level like this with, with the folks involved here. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, security, you know, making sure it's, you know, you know, safe in, you know, the, the sort of the aesthetics of the neighborhood and, and the uh, the fencing, you know, which we clearly will see. Um, and, and finally, you know, I, I guess it would be odor too. I mean, I, I, I just have a hard time believing that, you know, you've got greenhouses that are almost 100 years old and you're retrofitting them for a, a completely different use and you're not going to get some sort of smell coming out of there. Okay. I mean, if I may just interject uh, and add to that, um, you know, Neil says that there's no way where there would be an, an, any sort of an odor issue, but I'm wondering what um, uh, proof he has for that. If there is no, what, what is the precedent? What facilities has he worked with or worked on that have provided him with that background sure. knowledge? Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, uh, I've toured a medical cannabis facility in Rhode Island in preparation for this. I've also worked with several other growers, people that have been in the field for 10 plus years, I've been very fortunate to have, I have a friend who works for Scentsy Magazine, which is also, in, uh, and it's in the, in the middle of the marijuana industry. Uh, this is not new technology. I didn't invent this three-stage filtration system. I learned about it by studying and getting all of the relevant information needed in order to ensure that I have the minimal footprint possible because I wanna come to Wait I want Waitley to be my home. I'm not coming here as a big corporation. You know, I care about the, I want, I'm a local guy, you know, I'm a regular guy. I don't have, I'm not a, I'm not trying to have a yacht on or anything like that. No, I just want a farm so I can raise my, raise my kid here, you know, and, and I want to raise my son and wait. Um, and I know it's a little bit intrusive, but also I looked and I could not find a single example of property values decreasing. Uh, not to say that there isn't any, but I tried to find one where the property value of a nearby residence was decreased due to a uh, cultivation facility and I couldn't find one. Um, and as I've been researching, I did find some examples of property values going up in general in the, in the, in the town because it brought more jobs and improved the economy in certain areas. Not to say that that would necessarily happen here either, but I will do make every effort to make sure the farm is uh, renovated like the, the, the existing structures are kept from falling into disrepair and the farm continues to function as a farm. Because, uh, you know, I, I think the farm life is, is, has a lot of value and keeping this the way it is as much as possible, I think is, is important. You know, just to add to that, you know, when, we, when we're starting to work through our um, projections, financial projections, we're, we're starting to figure out how much we do need to allocate to capital expenditures and, and repairs of the facilities to, not only obviously make the operation better, but make them look more appealing and, and you know, the state of disrepair that they're in, we want to make sure we can, we can fix that and allocate some resources to that. That's important to us. Mm -hmm. It's important obviously to the community. So we, um, we're going to put our best foot forward there and, uh, and try to plan for it and, and do it in, in stages as quickly as we can. And do you have the capital necessary to do that right yes, now? We yes, we do. Okay. 
I'd like to ask a question that again on the getting back to the, the odor control without getting into the real details. Uh, I assume there's different levels of, of odor control for this facility and and others. Uh, and if whatever you put in there uh, doesn't work or, or isn't acceptable to to the neighborhood, uh, are there increased levels of equipment or, or venting that would that would help and and kind of the other question who's going to resolve that if you do establish there and their odors and the neighbors are saying we smell this all the time you got to do something what what is what is their avenue for for recourse i mean who's going to look at your facility and and say you need better over odor control Um, well, to answer the first question, to, to answer your first question, um, okay. yes, there are additional things that can be done. Uh, for example, with outdoor grows, there is a, a system of foggers mm -hmm. that detect, um, there are odorant detectors on, on the foggers, and when the odor plume move, moves uh, in, in the direction that you don't want it to go, the foggers release an odor neutralizing fog. So that could be put on top of all the filters within the sealed greenhouse out around the border of it so that if there are any escaping odors, that would be an additional layer of protection. Uh, we can also use uh, odorant detectors to uh, quantify the amount of smell um, that is being released right at the exhaust. And, and, and we can, I can record that. And, uh, and if there are any issues, be alerted Immediately, um, you know there are an, there's a, an application that goes to your phone. You can track the whole environment, uh, every aspect of the of the operation can be it will be tracked and be recorded. Um, so, we'll, if there are um, if you know if the odors coming out of the uh, exhaust are above a certain level, we could uh, make sure we quantify whatever that level is. Hopefully, we can reduce it to, to zero. That's my goal. But certainly, additional uh, carbon filters could be added as well. Um, as far as who's responsible to resolve it, if it's impossible, um, that, uh, uh, John mentioned possibly the zoning board. There might be it might be might be a, a question of, of of changing the zoning uh, rules. Putting additional putting additional uh, requirements or something if if there is an issue. But is there, I guess, acceptable levels or standard for acceptable levels of odor for a grow facility like yours? Most people use the smell test. Um, if you can't smell it, then it's acceptable. Is, but, that, uh, is that subjective though? Yeah, you would want to have several people do it and preferably the person with the most sensitive nose. Um, but uh, uh, and, and I, I, would, I would just rely on the odor detectors and try and get it as low as possible. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers of what's, what's uh, normal offhand, but I can, I can get those to you later. Okay. Um, hey, Fred, let me ask one, one final question then yeah. and then I'll stop. Um, would, would the company be willing to only open once the fencing and sight lines were to a to a level that were satisfactory to to that met the standards that anyone might have put in for instance and, and again I'm, I'm putting a hypothetical here um to create um some type of greenery that completely covers the chain link fence or a, a, a wooden fence on the on the neighbor's side, um, or near the roadside, and that until everyone, until everyone was satisfied that you had met the pre-established written agreement between the abutters and the grower, um, that you guys would not be allowed to open until that was satisfied. So I guess um, I can speak to that, Chris, if that's okay. Sure. 
So what we propose, um, obviously that's the whole purpose why we're here. We want to have the community outreach um, meeting to discuss this with the neighbors, make sure we're all on the same page and be able to adjust the plans accordingly. Um, obviously we're willing to have discussions with the neighbors and make sure we make it as aesthetically pleasing as possible. However, still complying with the, um, the, the Cannabis Control Commission as well as the ZBA and planning site plan approval requirements. So we're definitely open to have discussions and see how we can make it, you know, the least intrusive possible, but still complying with the regs. Okay. Um, now, Neil, you said you've you've worked on other other facilities. You said in Rhode Island and, and somewhere else that you're involved in. Well, I, I I toured uh, other facilities, and uh, uh, I I haven't worked at those facilities, but I have. Uh, uh, several um, associates who work at, at facilities, not only here, but also in Colorado and California, have had excellent advisement and also have done personal use grows for some time. So I know uh, uh, the ropes are going. As far as running the farm is concerned, I've been working here at LaSalle Flores uh, since August and learning everything uh, that John can teach me. And uh, John will stay for some time to ensure that uh, operations flow smoothly in the beginning and uh, and that we know what we're doing as far as uh, the farm goes, yeah, the facility. Okay, I guess what I was trying to get at is if you had experience other than, I guess, talking to other growers in other states, if we could uh, get information on how that facility operated and whether it was acceptable to the neighbors as far as odor control and and whether it was a proper facility that was addressing all, all the environmental issues. If we could see some background of how you were, did that or were going to do it, other than I guess you're just discussing it with us. Uh, May, may appease the, the town and the neighborhood that uh, something uh, beneficial and, and acceptable to us will, will occur. Otherwise, I guess it's just listening and your word that you know what you're doing and can address all the issues that we have. Well, certainly you can uh, uh, look at the, the plan that we have for addressing um, issues uh, that you may have you can add you can you can uh, speak you know ask me about those issues if you want um, as far as the uh, the carbon filtration the, the odor filtration systems I have been um, in facilities where they work and, and they, they work very well and there's different levels of uh, um, of um, uh, I guess of control and we were we were going for, for the maximum level here because we wanted to keep that uh, under wraps. The carbon filter filters every molecule of air uh, in every 15 minutes, every molecule of air in this space is filtered through the carbon filter. And then before they exhaust, they go through two more. Um, so um, they, they work very well. It's established, uh, it's fairly established technologies, but if there are issues, I'm happy to add additional filter, additional filters that filter the air even faster to the point where uh, we can get it to the way there's no order detectable. Okay. Can, can you provide us some information on, on, on this from, from other facilities, other locations that have controlled odor and how effective it is? Because I, I hear the proposal, you only had one or two pages talking about odor control. And, and I think it would make us all feel better if we could see more information on that. Certainly, yeah, I'll provide that uh, for the next meeting. And just to uh, Neil's point earlier, just to add to it, um, this is you know relatively new to Massachusetts, but it's been in, in other states for, for years and years. So there's a pretty you know exact science and this stuff has come up for years, odor control and other things of that nature have come up, um, and have been addressed. So there's a lot of good systems out there and, and science that has been implemented, which we would mirror um, and Neil's, you know, my opinion, expert on research and, and you know, experimentation, experimentation and, and learning these things. And he's gone through the process. And I think part of the reason why I think there was only a couple of pages devoted to it, I think it's down to a pretty, 
pretty good science right now, but we're happy to um, share our research and some other examples. Okay, I think that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, so, so Fred, for the for the purposes of tonight, um, I think at the end of the night they're requesting permission to um, hold a, a remote community outreach, a virtual community outreach meeting once once a discussion's done. Correct. Okay. So, is there any other before we get into that uh, scheduling that any other anybody else have any comments they wish to make? Uh, okay, Joyce. Yeah, I, my, I guess my comments are really kind of questions or clarifications, I guess. And the first one might actually be a question for for uh, for Brian. I mean, we're, we, we've been through this before where someone comes to us and says, we're going to build this and none of the neighbors are going to uh, object because we're going to do screening and we're going to do all this other stuff. But it doesn't always work out that all the promises are kept. So maybe the question for Brian is, um, how, um, what would be the process be for compelling them to do something when there's an odor complaint or when there's a complaint about the lighting? And I had some follow-up questions about the lighting because I wanted to confirm that I understood what you were saying. Is if it's really the ZBA and the planning board setting those parameters, is it the building inspector who does the enforcement? Yes. Like what's the? Yeah, yep, that's that's correct. So if um, the neighbors, if this is, this were to all happen and the neighbors had a complaint about the odor, then we would call the building inspector, and yep. the building inspector gets to make the decision about what is the group compelled to do. How does the building inspector compel the people to who are running the business to do? Like they're in the middle of a growing season. They're making this smell. Yeah. You call the building inspector. The building inspector <clears throat> says, hey, it smells. Yeah. So how, like, like, do you have any idea? And it may, maybe you don't have a specific idea, but what, what happens next that will compel that to be remediated in a timely manner? So, so what most likely would happen is the building inspector would issue a notice of violation. Um, and that would be in writing and it would get sent to the, the property owner telling them that, hey, you're violating. So in this case, whatever the provision is that says there can't be any odor detectable mm -hmm. off the property you're, uh, and you need to stop doing it. Um, really how they, how they go about resolving that violation is, is in a sense up to them. Um, if they wanna add more filters, um, if they wanna hype, I don't know, it will really be up to them, but the idea is, is that they need to stop whatever the violation is, um, and that's that's enforceable by fines. That's enforceable by um, hopefully it would never get this far. It could be enforceable by injunctions in court, um, cease and desist letters, those types of things. So there's there, there's mechanisms, legal mechanisms, which, which can right. help compliance. Um, and and is there anything about a timeline? Like like I don't know that the plants smell during the whole period of their growth. But can the kind of the can the timeline be sort of drawn out? Like, oh, I got this violation. Oh, I'm doing something about it, doing something about it, doing something. About it. And then all of a sudden, well, the plants are no longer in that phase. They're not making the smell. So it becomes a recurring problem that happens for such a short, a short enough period that we don't really catch up with it. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I worry a little bit about the mechanism for enforcing the the promises that people are making, and I. Um, I, and I can't say that I understand um, completely what the mechanisms would be, but I, I, I do worry about that a little bit based on, you know, even, even you know, promises for, for screening that companies, you know, like, yeah, we, have, we put some trees in, well, they all died. Okay. So, <laughs> and, and we're having a hard time compelling people to follow through on their promises. So I, I to me, that's one one of my concerns uh, here. Um, and the other, I guess the other is really is a question about the, the, the lighting. Um, so I, you, you've got to educate me here. I am a physics teacher. I consider myself educable on these things. I know what light is. <laughs> I know how it travels. And what I understood was that the, 
lights inside the greenhouse would be on when it's dark outside so that the plants will continue to grow even though it's dark outside because they need light to grow. But you made it sound like there was going to somehow be like some kind of opaque dome yeah. covering so that there isn't any bleeding of that light to outside. Yeah. So, no, I, so is that so? So it, please correct me because that does, that doesn't sound reasonable. So and, and I don't think you're proposing something that's unreasonable. So can you help me understand better how you're going to block the nighttime lighting from Joyce, the neighborhood? Joyce, I I can answer that. Okay, There's, great. Uh, there are blackout uh, curtains that we can use inside. It'll be inside the greenhouse. Oh, which okay. Can be drawn to cover. Uh, the growing area itself, not on the outside, but it'll okay. be on the inside to to uh, black out the light. The lights will still be on for the plants, but they should be, except for a very minimal amount of light uh, that might be in a crease or something like that. Okay. Uh, so it would be it would be blacked out that okay. way. Okay, so blackout that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, and then um, for security, I understand that sometimes there are fears that there'll be lots of lights outside for security. My understanding is that our bylaws uh, uh, encourage, they may not require, but they encourage the use of infrared cameras for the security rather than um, relying on outdoor lighting. And I just wanted to double check that you're, yeah. you and I are working on the same, same uh, assumption here that you're yes. gonna use the infrared cameras so that you don't I'm need to have a lot of external lighting because it seems Absolutely. to be those are just two separate lighting problems. One is external lighting for security, and the other is internal lighting for growth. That's and, right. Yeah. yeah okay. we're, we're we're not going to have lights on uh, other you know, those greenhouse lights. Uh, other than that, uh, being covered as far as in the parking lot and and for the ability of the security cameras to see, we're going to use the the security cameras that can see in the dark. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions, discussion? Okay, I guess the next step is to schedule a, a community outreach meeting. Yeah, they're, they're requesting permission to, to um, in accordance with the, the revised CCC regulations to hold the community outreach meeting virtually. Okay. In, in under the regulations, it's within the authority of the select board to uh, grant that. It's part of the the, the COVID nineteen regulations, and the board had the board has granted this once to um, the proposed establishment that's uh, at on River Road. Okay, and and the the individual boards can also request a site visit if they so choose, which has happened before. Well, so this would just, uh, that's that's within the purview of the planning board and zoning right. board. This is strictly a requirement of the uh, the CCC. Right, okay. So what what uh, dates are we looking at? Um, I don't know that, I mean, they're seeking permission to, to hold the, the, the community outreach meeting virtually. And then the date could be determined at a, at a later time. I, I personally don't see the problem with having a virtual meeting. That's, that's what we should be doing in these days of, of, of COVID. Um, anything we can do to keep people safe and, and still and, and still um, be uh, taking actions to, to make sure that all sides are heard and that that uh, and you, I, again, I don't I don't think we have we we should restrict the the virtual nature of the meeting at all. Okay, yeah, I have no problem with moving ahead with a virtual meeting. Joyce? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see any reason to restrict this group over any other particular group that uh, we've allowed to have the community outreach. And I think definitely outreach to the community and you've got some idea of what people's concerns are now, but um, I, I think virtually is the way to do that, as John mentioned. I, I would like to make sure though that um, we do a little legwork or somebody does a little legwork to make sure that especially any of the abutters um, on the Sal Drive or Claverack Road or anybody anywhere else have absolute access to um, the, the Zoom or whatever is being created so that we're not being restrictive because 
Um, people don't have that kind of technology. Um, yep. and, and I really think we may, gotta make sure that we double check that um, and, and get some level of confirmation that everyone has access. If I could um, just uh, touch base on that, the CCC has specific guidelines on how to publish the Zoom information and how to contact the direct abutters with that information. So we'll make sure to touch base um, on all of that and make sure we're following procedures specifically to ensure that everybody has access and is able to attend and participate. And, and what happens if they don't? If they don't participate in the meeting? No, if they don't have access. Um, I don't know, Chris, I, I'm sure we would, you know, if we're able to comply with COVID, if it has to be an additional site visit or a meeting, I'm sure our, you know, yeah, our team would be able to accommodate that. We'd accommodate, but I believe also there everything should be recorded as well, so they should be able to access it on the on the town site as well if they did miss it, um, or some other method. We could figure out a way to get it to them, but we, we certainly have no no means to exclude anybody um, intentionally. So we'll do whatever it takes to make sure everybody's uh, heard and 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 uh, communicated with. Yeah, if I if I may, Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, I, I our understanding is that some of the neighbors don't have computers um, around the area, so that's something to consider. You know when scheduling this uh but also uh who who exactly moderates this meeting and, and what you know is there anyone from the town moderating it or is it just sort of a gathering where you know kind of select presents you know what they want to do and then kind of hears us out How, what's the structure of this typically uh it's it's a it's a requirement of the ccc of the applicant um so it, it's not a it's not a town of waitley Meeting. It's something they're required to do under the under the cannabis control regulations. Mm -hmm. Will any town representatives be there? Is that typical? Um, if you're asking historically, um, yes, there have been town representatives there, um, but um, I can't. I guess I can't answer for them. I don't know their. I don't know their schedules. Can you can, or Neil or, or Bob, can you speak to what in the in the Beckett one? I wasn't able to make that one. Can you share some, you know, how that one went and how it was uh, approached? Sure. With with the Beckett meeting, uh, everything went through the planning board. We didn't have to go through the selectmen. It's just towns are different, I guess, with how they approach it. Uh, we had a planning board meeting right after the outreach meeting, uh, and uh, I believe there was uh, some people from the planning board didn't say anything, just uh, attended it. We kept a roster of who attended. And uh, then we write, went right into the planning board meeting. Those who attended the outreach meeting uh, stayed around and had more discussion with us in the planning board. So it was an open uh, situation. And uh, then we proceeded from there. Okay, Christine. Yes, and I'm glad that the meetings are recorded. That's a that's a very positive thing. But my concern is access um, for other abutters and folks that may have a vested concern and have questions that can't um, ask those and approach those um, issues in real time um, in the aftermath of everything. So I think that mm -hmm. access is always important to consider. And thank you thank for you bringing for that that as um, something to really strive for, for the inclusion. I'm, I'm wondering whether a solution, and I'm pausing because I'm wanting to choose my words carefully. I'm wondering whether a solution is if an abutter can demonstrate that they do not have access to a Zoom, whether they can somehow attend something in person so they will be able to also phone in uh, which some individuals do to these zoom meetings as well all the public hearings and meetings they are able to call on to the zoom as well zoom. Yeah, so zoom zoom would allow a, a call in number just like a normal right. conference call or something like that um, right. the only thing they would miss is the sheet screen sharing and things of that nature but you know I'm not sure what the technology um, level is, but there's an app for Zoom that you can use for calling or video. But um, again, we're happy to accommodate um, by whatever means um, you guys see fit. You guys see best. The video shows up on 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 my phone if I dial in by phone, and the video shows up on the computer if. So, yep. you know. Yep. If I may, um, uh, the lack of technological expertise has been a bit of a roadblock I, I know for some of the abutters 
Um, I know that my father-in-law literally went door to door to get in touch with some of the neighbors who he knew would be concerned. Um, and he's not here tonight because the phone in part is confusing because you can't see who is speaking. I mean, we have the benefit of all of the names and the faces here. Um, and I know that it's not just the Sibolskis, there are other neighbors um, on the abutters list that are affected by that as well. And I know that this is, you know, it's, it's COVID time. Um, and this is one of the downsides of that. But um, like Christine said, access and accessibility really is, is, is important if we truly want to hear from everyone who would be impacted. Okay. Do you think we could get, um, again, I'm not sure who's supposed to be coordinating all this or if it's, if it's us, but if we wouldn't know, know of anybody who doesn't have technology capabilities, but if we could potentially get a, a list of that, we could probably try to figure out an alternative uh, means of, of communicating with them, um, whether that's a I don't know what the gathering sizes are allowed now, and, and I'm, I'm in New York, not Massachusetts, but here they're 10. If we could do a smaller gathering with social distancing, we'd be happy to do that too um, in a second type of meeting. But um, I'm just not sure how we would get knowledge of those without technology um, capability. So we just need that list. So, so, you, pro so you provide written notification to direct the butters? Yep. So that's 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 the way that you can communicate with them if it's if it's if it has to be if if you can't if you can't do it remotely then then please call us and we could set okay. up alternative arrangements or something like that maybe. Okay, yeah. so be part of our what we what we um, publish what we put publicly we just put a if you're not able to connect via Zoom call this number for additional. Like that. I mean I, that's that's one idea. I don't know if, what the board feels about that. But. Okay. Uh, my concern is that we absolutely need to make this meeting happen. Um, we want to give everyone the opportunity to discuss and, and voice their opinions uh, in, in a civil way. Um, the, the property owner needs to have, have that um, because th this is something that, that impacts not just the business and not just the butters, but also a property owner. Um, so we need to make sure that this happens. And if we have to go the extra mile to make sure it happens with some being remote, some being in, in person safely, then, then we should be doing that. Sure. Yep. Well, let me just say that the, I know at least ZBA and, and probably planning board sends out notices to all the abutters within a certain distance of the property. Uh, they notify them directly by mail uh, of the public meeting that's held by that board. So there is names and addresses of all them abutters. Uh, I guess you're, you're welcome to get that from them uh, when you come to, the, to that point in the process. And, and the other thing I mentioned earlier is, is a site visit. Some of these boards have site visits where, where you invite the, the board members and, and I guess anybody of the public to the site, to the location, and you discuss and show what you're doing to the property. You can have maps or descriptions, whatever, but everybody practices the, the uh, COVID uh, restrictions as far as being masks, uh, uh, wearing masks, being six feet away and uh, social distancing, uh, that kind of stuff. That's happening at site visits. So if an, if an abutter wants to talk directly with, with the proposal here, they can do that at, at a site visit for either planning or ZBA whenever that is, is scheduled. So there is that opportunity. Okay. I know we'd be open, we'd be open to site visits for small groups as, as needed if they couldn't do it on a, on a regular meeting. Right. And Brian, just a quick question as well. Um, as far as the publication of the, the notice, um, if it is approved to have a virtual meeting, which paper would be the preference of the board to publish that in? Um, I don't know. Board, what do you think? Greenfield Recorder? Is that both? Legal notices go to the Greenfield Recorder. OK, yeah. great. Thank you. It wouldn't hurt to have it in the Gazette as well, because there's a number of people who subscribe to that. We're kind of right on the border between <coughs> between those two. 
um, newspapers. Okay, thank you. Go on. And just, to, and just to sort of lay out the process, um, the remaining process with the select board, it, um, we've had our preliminary meeting tonight. Um, the applicants will um, hold their community outreach meeting. And then it's been a practice of the board that, that myself and a member of the board, it's been Joyce in the past, um, then uh, discusses host community agreement with the applicants and then we bring it back to a full meeting of the select board for approval. Um, is that the same process that, well, I should say back to the board for consideration. Um, I don't want to presume anything. Um, is that the same process that we want to do? Yes. Yeah. And it's Joyce want to do that? <laughs> yeah. Of course, Joyce wants to do that. Yes. Oh, of course, it's my job. Has, has, um, has, has, have past host community agreements been distributed for uh, template purposes in terms of, because we don't deviate very much from these host community agreements. Yes, I've sent uh, two of them to uh, Sophia. Okay. Yep, and then before we wrap this up, we would need to, we would need a, a motion and a roll call vote on the virtual community outreach meeting. And if you want to add conditions about whatever we discussed, then that would be an appropriate time to do it. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I know whether it's part of the motion or not, but would still would like to see something on the odor control. What your what your experience is uh, at other facilities and how they handle the different degrees of control. Uh, I guess whether some sort of references or or written material, if you wish to provide. I, I guess I would like to see that and and make that, we can make that available to, to the other boards. So the other boards are gonna be asking for that, but, but I guess I, I think it's important now to see that because it's a, a critical item here. Sure. So, yeah. you know, you can speak to that a little better. I think we have obviously in our, in our proposal, the couple pages there, we'll do some additional research and get some examples. And, and uh, you know, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. We'll, uh, we'll provide additional uh, explanations uh, of how it's done and, uh, and details of uh, what, the, you know, what the standards are for uh, other facilities. Okay, make a motion that we uh, move forward on, on this process with uh, asking a proposal to uh, schedule a Community outreach meeting. Yeah, how do we include in that um, motion that what we just just discussed about um, kind of in a way special outreach to people with uh, less access to technology? Um, is there is that something that belongs in the motion? Do you think, Brian? I mean, it, it, then later it comes up like what's enforceable, right? Um, right. I, I mean, I, I think it would be good to include something that that something along the lines of the board approves the uh, the virtual community outreach meeting um, with the condition that the notice include um, contact information for Amy's going to love this um, contact information for um, people who what's a good word for not technology, not technologically savvy. Um, who can arrange for uh, uh, on, you know, uh, COVID safe on site uh, meeting or gathering? Mm -hmm. Just something question, along the lines. They, could we send you a draft of our proposed communication and for approval? Would that help? And then mm -hmm. I think they would. Wouldn't the people who couldn't make it to the virtual meeting contact us? Is that the way it works? Or I just want to make sure we're following the correct process. So we, as long as we yeah. have our contact information and. We can somehow prove that prove that we've been in touch with with these folks and and you know made our effort to schedule something with them somehow. Is that sufficient? You think? Yeah, I think it's good to just kind of clarify what is the um, what is the expected effort on their part to uh, contact. Uh, I think it's primarily the abutters who may not have either the access or or maybe the, technologically compromised. 
Like, yes. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, I, yeah. Those all sound bad. But those just, are the things that people have access, but they may be technologically compromised. Yeah. Or um, yeah. Here. So I, I don't know what's the right um, difficulty accessing technology. That sounds less like you're telling them they're dumb. <laughs> which I don't want to tell people they're dumb. They're not dumb. It's no, I mean, I, some people, it's a choice. It's that's a lifestyle right. and, choice. And I use this every day, so it's not a big deal for me. Um, so, um, Is there any yeah. issue with, with um, phone calls only? Because, again, if someone calls us, tries to reach us, we miss a call. We don't really know if they left the message. Is there proof? Should we have it? Be, is there an email? I mean, is that a reasonable method, or is that not even... It, because we just want to be a trail of, of this stuff so we, we can prove that we've taken those efforts and we can provide an email to say we've attempted to schedule with this person versus phone calls back and forth. There's really no, I'm just trying to, I just want to understand the best way to, to get it done. Um, I think you really need to have a phone number. I know my father-in-law would um, make a phone call and I know that one or two of the people that he spoke with directly, they don't have email. They literally, one of them doesn't have a computer. Um, mm -hmm. So there would need to be a phone number. And I, and I do think for a meeting like this, that the telephone only, audio only is probably not um, not a good substitute for a real uh, a meeting. I think I would like you to be able to offer some alternative other than just phoning in. Um, There's somewhere publicly they could go in a small yeah. group. Uh, you, were you were talking about small group. Like, yeah. yeah, so if someone calls you and says, I can't do this Zoom thing, uh, calling in on the phone is really not going to be sufficient. Can we arrange a small meeting? And you sounded like earlier you were willing to arrange sure. uh, a small or something that would fit within the COVID guidelines and so on. I was um, just wondering if they could go to the town somewhere and sit in a room with a with a, a screen or projector. Is there something where they could watch the Zoom there together? Uh, I, most of our town buildings are closed to the okay. public except for right. business at the window in town hall. So okay. I'm not sure. I think the site visit option is probably the best. We can do it there as long as it's obviously yeah. a record of it. And Neil, you, know, you guys good with that process? Yeah, we could. Uh, I mean, there's some space here, uh, for example, at the flower shop that's big enough to, that we could host a limited number of people that, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. imagine it's going to be a lot of people that, that yeah. need help. So uh, um, we, uh, have you know the, the access uh, with our devices so they could they could come here and may I that. propose maybe one of the town schools um, they have internet capability um, I could even offer myself to be there to help those who are technologically challenged um, or do not have access to technology mm -hmm. could they meet in a town school parish hall at once preset designated time just just throwing that out there mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like you're saying have a have an in-person component for a limited number of people this board i don't believe and brian correct me if i'm wrong we don't have uh control over the schools to be able to compel the schools to say you must host a meeting for some people who want to have an in-person meeting is that that's that's true and i think you get um I think you'd get significant pushback. Um, they're trying to keep the schools um, closed up to only students at this point with all the the COVID nineteen issues. And, and it, okay, let's let's move on here. Let's I guess rather than discussing how to contact everybody, leave it up to I guess Chris or Sophia to, to get with with okay. Brian once we decide on a date and how and when are we gonna contact all these people uh, and what, what their names and addresses are. Uh, that can be worked out. We don't need to go into a lot well, of detail. Right some now, of it has to be in the motion, Fred. Okay. That was the whole thing that started this. Make a motion that uh, we proceed with a community outreach meeting uh, by uh, the proposal here, Waitley RE Holdings LLC proceed with a community outreach meeting. Second. Okay, we'll call vote. Joyce? Um, no. We should, we should. The, the motion needs to contain something regarding 
what is expected of the, the that you know, we're, we're talking about outreach to people who aren't going to necessarily get on a Zoom call. And that was the whole point for the motion to contain something about what's expected of them because that's what's enforceable. Here's, here's my concern with this. If <clears throat> I'm guessing we're talking about 20 people ballpark or more. 20 people without technology? Um, yeah, 20, no, 20 people in total um, who are considered abutters or is it more than 20? I don't, I, don't even think we, I don't even think we've had 20 people at, at once in the past. I guess, I guess my point is, is that if you can have socially distanced, a social distance meeting in a greenhouse and limit, but we need to limit the number of people who are in the greenhouse because it has to be six feet apart, you know, masks have to be required. My question would be then to, to, I guess, John. John, do you guys have, does your wireless reach to the greenhouse? Um, I don't know <laughs> whether the wireless reaches into the greenhouse or not. I'm sure we can, we can make it work. Wouldn't it just be a second meeting on site? Like the same purpose as the first meeting, just a second meeting for those that can't get on the Zoom to do an in-person meeting, to ask the same type of, or to, to field the same type of questions and concerns. That's what I was anticipating, not, not a full group, all the abutters at the greenhouses. I was just saying a separate special meeting for those who can't make the, the regularly scheduled Zoom. That's what I was, I, I just wanna make, make sure I'm understanding it correctly. I guess you could do it that way. My my sense is that a community meeting really has its best synergies when everyone's in the in the, in the same meeting as opposed to having it split up. But so that's why I asked the question. I did. It may not be possible, and so so um, Chris, your solution may be the way we have to do it. Um, but I, I'm just trying to, you know, we could, we could host it. Um, uh, the, those who don't have access. Uh, in the possibly in the flower shop, which does have internet uh, in the flower shop, if, especially if there's only if there's less than three, there's enough room in there to socially distance. Uh, there are you know comfy chairs and, and stuff like that in there too, um, and that could be during the community outreach meeting where uh, uh, they they could come at the same time as the meeting mm -hmm. so that they could access it here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we all have those synerg synergies. As you, as you so pointed out. Okay, well then maybe the motion should be um, that I, I move that we approve the uh, remote community outreach meeting on the condition that abutters are notified that they have the option to uh, attend in person uh, or make other arrangements uh, to participate if they can't um, or are not comfortable with participating by Zoom. I mean, I, I think you're right that it's going to be a matter of two or three people. And so what you just said actually makes sense. I don't want to say what, I don't want to specify exactly what it is, right? But I think that's broad enough that you, you're going to arrange for people who can't do the remote and you can have a remote meeting for those who can. It, it seems like and I, I would put that in the motion the, uh, that that it, you know the, that you will be notifying the abutters and letting them have that alternative um, if they can't make the Zoom. Does that seem reasonable? That seems to catch the spirit of what we're talking about. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So we're we're asking for in in person meeting for a remote. No. A remote meeting with the option of, with the option for those who can't join a remote meeting to be there in person. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen the room. Board of Health would say whether it's safe enough for two or three, um, but they just we have to find a, a COVID safe uh, other option, as is what I'm saying. So basically an option for in-person participation for those who don't have the capability. Right. 
Um, yes, and I don't want to prescribe what that is. If, it, if the flower shop works out fine, um, if it has to be outdoors on a sunny day, that I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say what it is. Okay, so extra. We'll, put that, we'll put that in our. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. We'll put that in our communication. And is there any need for us to circulate a draft of that to to Brian or anyone else? I'd be comfortable with Brian uh, taking a look at it on our behalf. Okay. Okay, so that's your amendment to my motion. Okay. Uh, we have a roll call vote on- we have, to, we, we have to vote on the amendment first, Fred, and then you vote on the motion with the amendment. Sorry. Okay, I thought it was the other way around. But okay, okay. Uh, roll call vote on, on my original motion. No, on the amendment, Fred. The amendment. Wait, wait a minute here. We're, we're voting to include the amendment in the motion. And then if the amendment is included in the motion, then we vote on the motion. If you can't vote on the motion without the amendment until. Okay, so we're voting on the motion with the amendment. Okay, well. Call vote, Joyce. Uh, I'm in favor of the motion with the amendment only. Okay, Jonathan. Yes. Okay, Fred. Yes. Now I will make a motion to vote on the motion. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, I'll I'll second it. Let's get this over with. Exactly. Okay. We'll call vote, Jonathan. Yep. Joyce? Yes. Brian? Yes. Okay. See what this pandemic is doing to everybody? We got to get back. No, I know. Emotions. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank okay. you very much. Move, moving on. We've got a lot of other items here on the agenda. Uh, next item is Waitley Diner asking for changes in the alcohol license. Brian, are they? Yeah, John's here. John, I won't try to pronounce your last name. No, that's okay. It's a uh, Peninchini. I would. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, could you proceed, John? And, and uh... yeah. yes. Uh, so we're we're looking to change the corporate name from the license of NEC o, uh, OPCO Inc. to Norea Energy Retail. Um, this is due to a corporate restructuring, uh, the ownership of the, you know, it really drills down to the same person. Uh, the owner of Norea is Tony L. Niemer. So, uh, really it's just for a corporate restructuring. Okay. Managers, the manager is saying the same. Yes. Yes, sir. Anybody have any comments? No, I'm good. Yeah. Um, so what motion do we need to proceed? Uh, we move to approve the change in uh, in name on the license. Yep. So I would move that. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay. All right, we'll get that signed, John, and we'll get it out in the mail. Thank you, folks. Have a great evening. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Moving on, the Whaley Inn wants us to consider a request for a reduction in the renewal fee for their alcohol license. Is Whaley Inn on? No, I, I invited Chip to come, but um, I don't see him on here. Um, so we have the we have the letter. Um, I don't know. The letter was in the packet. Oh, um, let me take a second look at that. Okay. I can share it on my screen if you want. Yeah. Uh, what, do you know what page in the packet it is? Um, Scrolling through here. 
not off the top of my head. Okay. It's it's not too long after the um, after the, the the financials piece. The the, the yeah, I was gonna say there we go, licensing authority. Yeah. Let's see that one. There we go. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I'm not uh, I'm not opposed to granting that request myself. I don't know if anybody else has a strong feeling. I know he's very cooperative with us on the sidewalk project. I don't know where you know payments for that cross over with one thing or another. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, so long as I, I, I don't think we have any any particular beef with him on uh, on anything. Okay. Is he does does the Whitley Inn still owe money on the on the sidewalk crossing? discussion yes they still owe us um right around ten thousand dollars pursuant would, to the agreement when would that be considered late at this point or no um i mean the project is done and we have uh we have paid the contractor so we're expecting payment now yes right i guess my question is brian when was there a was there an invoice that was sent uh, communication about about this how, how how long ago was that um so an invoice sent no um i've had i mean i had keith and, keith and i've had discussions all along that that it needs to be paid um in terms of the first official request maybe two weeks yeah i i i'm not sure i want to totally tie these two together um mm -hmm. i i would encourage us to just to send a a, a very you know, friendly reminder that, you know, the town does need to have have this paid. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to tie the two together because I believe he will pay it and he's because he's a great community member and neighbor. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's it's only fair that we remind that that payment needs to be needs to be made. Okay. But I'm with Joyce. I think we should we should help out those people who are having a tough time or a tougher time than normal these days. Well, I mean, Keith, Keith uh, I think he's still on is it all completed the work for their parking lot the only thing that has not been completed is the line painting in the parking lot of the waitley inn and that can't be done until the tent comes down and under my last communication with chip that was happening december 1st that's when they were going to start doing their next big project which was revamping the front porch and the um handicap ramp so my understanding is we you know as soon as the tent comes down the line painting can be done we're talking a couple hundred dollars for that that would be town expense what's that fred no town would be doing the line painting yeah at this point in time for the small amount it's not a problem for the contractor i had i'll i'll consider it part of the ten thousand dollars that he put towards the entire project and that you know I guess I don't have the date that he signed the agreement I mean it's not like it's not like you know he didn't know it's been coming we the, the signed contract was probably back in June maybe Brian or earlier yeah well, yeah we needed to sign contract before we would before we would begin the project okay so this this uh, reduction he's asking for is that for the upcoming year or is that for this year that already went by i believe it was phrased for the upcoming year for but we're treating year. it as for the upcoming year for the upcoming year is it is it fair to you know the upcoming year being calendar year correct yeah yeah is, is it fair to grant this um for six months and then revisit based upon where where things stand with um COVID guidelines that the state has issued or our local uh, Board of Health has issued? Well, we usually look for payment for the licenses for the full year. Well, but why why not revisit it, you know, in June before our fiscal year closes? Um, and, and, and then either ask for, you know, the remainder, or if, if, if things are looking looking better, we can we can we can adjust accordingly. I don't know. I'm I'm just making sure we think about all options. 
Okay. Uh, Brian, what, what fees are we talking about here? Um, the in the inholder, um, all alcoholic beverages is twenty two hundred. Inholder license is twenty seven dollars and fifty cents, and the common victuallers is twenty seven dollars and fifty cents. So it's a total of two thousand two hundred fifty five dollars. So half of that. Yeah. Okay, eleven eleven hundred something. We're we're asking. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you go ahead. It's not, a, it's not a big amount, I guess, to the town, but. $1,127.50. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I just, you know, I want to I want to be very fair to people. And but, you know, if, if anyone can forecast what things are going to look like in, in, in July, August, September, you know, geez, good for you. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I just think revisiting well, things yeah. makes all the sense in the world these days. Right. Uh, but I mean, right now, what he's asking for is a 50% reduction for next year's license. Yeah. I feel like that's the question we should address. You know, it, anything can always be revisited in the future. But uh, uh, I, it, I think he's making a reasonable request. And um, I would move that we, um, I mean, given this uh, also that we spoke about this at our previous meeting, um, that he's provided at least uh, some numbers. So it's close to a 50% reduction in uh, sales um, while other costs are staying the same. Um, so I, I think 50% makes sense. Um, so I would I would move that we uh, approve a reduction 50% for the Waitley Inns the license. Second, second the motion. Okay, roll call vote, Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay. Moving on. Next item is Chief Sabine providing an update on activities of the police department. Good evening. Yeah. Hi, Jim. So I have um, I have just a list of things, just the, the goings on, if you will, of the police department. Um, not sure specifically if you're looking for um, itemized information, but I just, I came up with some things just to talk with you guys about. I think the, probably one of the main things was the, even though we've been doing kind of reduced patrols during the, the COVID to reduce our interaction with the, with the uh, general public, with the complaints and stuff that came in from um, the Chestnut Plain Road, people that were complaining about the speeding. Um, we have, since June, we have done 81 specific patrols on uh, Chestnut Plain Road, sitting doing stationary radar, patrolling that specific area. Um, we've issued 44 violations um, on that road. We've also, <clears throat> issued 16 stop sign violations at the Christian or the uh, Chestnut Plain Road and Haydenville Road intersection. And we've also, that's kind of part of that, we stretched that into patrols onto Haydenville Road as well. So there was an additional 21 patrols specifically itemized for uh, for Haydenville Road. So in that, in that area, I mean, we've done a over 100, 100 specific patrols um, for that traffic enforcement um, and, request. And what, what, how long is a patrol? Is a patrol one hour or is a patrol an incident of citation or? Uh, it, it could be an incident for a citation. It could be sitting on the side of the road for a half hour, an hour, different times, uh, different days, mornings, afternoons. Right, right. But I'm just trying to get like 81 as a number. I'm trying to translate that into like hours or or something like that. I, I wouldn't be able to translate it into hours for you. It, it could be, you know, I know from my perspective um, in the morning going up there or sit up there sometimes for a half hour, 45 mm -hmm. minutes, slowing okay. traffic down. Um, yeah. Some people will sit up there for 15 minutes before they issue a citation. Um, you know, maybe, oh, okay. Maybe so the, sit up there so for two or three hours. Yeah. So it's unlikely to be like e each patrol is likely to have at least gotten one citation. Would that be? 
Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. Maybe more, I know maybe less. There's plenty of times that I've sat up there in the morning and I haven't had any violations go by me. Okay. There's been plenty of opportunities to, to okay. sit up there. So that still counts as a patrol, even though it didn't result in a citation. Okay. Yes, Just because it was entered strange. it was entered into our record management system as a as a specific patrol for that area. There's not to say that officers don't, don't frequently right. go down that road and just right. up in as a specific patrol. I mean, we're up in that area all the time. Right. Okay. I go up there every day to get mail and go through there to get to West Waitley. So. Um, okay, understood. I just don't always understand the terminology. So I just wanted to make yes. sure I understood what you're talking about. Tim, could you just comment on, I know I understand stop sign violations. People don't stop, but on, on Chestnut Plain, what are the, the violations and, and uh, are you finding speeding less or, or more? And I know you've put speed limit flashing signs out there and, and because of your presence, are you seeing any, any differences? Um, we, we have seen a reduction in what we've seen as far as speeding goes. You know, the, the amount of time that we would sit in an area um, before a violation would come by. Um, we, we find that we're having to, to sit up there longer to, to see a violation. Uh, so people are definitely getting the, getting the hint, they're getting the message, they're, they're slowing down, which isn't anything out of the norm. I mean, this, this happens all the time when we do targeted patrols. You know, we do targeted patrols for a while, um, they, people slow down, and then we have to hit other roads to do targeted patrols. And by the time we're done with all of the targeted patrols, everybody's back to speeding on the initial road. <laughs> It's a vicious cycle that we we keep yeah. fighting over and over and over again. So, okay, continue, please. Uh, so that's as far as um, just the specific enforcements for Chestnut Plain Road, Haydenville Road area. So that's I just gave you some numbers for that. Um, as Fred mentioned, we we do have the me message boards in now. We've been using the message board for. Um, notification for speed. We're waiting for a push of some software to be able to do the data collection, which will be a helpful tool for us to collect the speeds of the vehicles, number of vehicles, average speeds, all that stuff. Um, so we're, we're just waiting on that software to come down uh, so we can start doing that as well. And we have a plan to kind of move weather permitting, you know, as long as we, we still have uh, decent weather, we're going to continue to move the the uh, message board, the white message board is the one with the, the radar capabilities. The orange one is just for notifications. Um, so we're gonna make every attempt to move that sign around. It's right now down at the railroad crossing on Christian Lane. It's been there for the most, better part of this week. Um, next week, we're gonna move it up to Long Plain Road where we've also had some complaints um, just in the hopes that the addition of the message board will, will hopefully get the message out to people and and slow them down a little bit. Um, so we do have a, a plan for, for you to, utilizing the sign. We're waiting on a couple of grant opportunities for the posted signs or the, the speed signs they get mounted on the poles. Um, so it'd be more of a permanent thing where they stay up there more longer term. Um, so we'll hopefully know something this week, um, whether or not we're gonna be getting any of those moving forward. Uh, let's see what else up there. So some of the, the big things that we've been seeing <clears throat> are unemployment fraud claims. Um, there's not a lot that we can do from uh, in an, what do you call it, a investigative perspective. Um, we've, we've attempted, other departments have attempted there's now something set up with the state for filing unemployment claims, false unemployment claims. Um, it's unfortunately a lot of work for the person that, that falls victim to that. They have to kind of freeze their, their credit. They have to notify their banks and credit companies, notify the three credit companies. Um, they got to file a, a claim, a form with the, with the state that somebody's fraudulently attempted to uh, open up a unemployment claim in their name. And I point that out just because it's, it's such a common thing. We just in the last month, we've had about a dozen of them, a dozen calls that come in. I know we've had a number of town employees. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's becoming a kind of a, a, a big pain in the neck for people. There hasn't been a lot of 
um, loss, like identity theft that turns into loss from, from a victim perspective, it's just more the, the work that they have to put in to, to protect their, their identity and to watch their credit and their bank accounts and all that stuff. So it is a lot of work for people. So we basically just coach them through the process, give them the information. We posted the location. We posted a link on our website, how to get into there to, to file that claim and information attached to that. So we've got information listed there along with other identity theft information as well. So hopefully people have the ability to, to access that information. Um, so we are currently into about six weeks going in. I think this is our sixth week of, of training for our new officer that was appointed. Um, he's almost ready to be released to be working on his own. He's in the, the final phase now, which is the shadowing phase. So he's working um, and we have another officer working at the same time. So um, they can assist if need be, but that the new officer is primary answering calls and, and doing what needs to be done during the shift. So um, training is going very well. He's being well received by the, the community. Um, at least the members that we've spoken with so far, we've had the opportunity to interact with. Um, any other officers that have worked with them have positive things to say. So things are things are going well in that sense, as far as training goes. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of training, we are in our training season. So in-service training is coming up for us. So um, each officer has to undergo 40 hours of training every year. So we're going to be doing some most of the stuff online again this year because of the, the COVID situation. So we'll be doing a lot of uh, online training because we're not open up for, for training, having meetings here at the station. So um, we're gonna be doing most of that online. Message board use, I've got that. Um, we did have two successful flu clinics that we participated in. One was for this specifically for the senior center, which went well. And then we had one that was kind of open to the region. Anybody that wanted to come, um, it was done at the Deerfield uh, Highway Department. <clears throat> that was a, a successful event. I forget how many people, but it was in excess of 600 vaccinations that they, they had for the flu. Um, I think there was an, an additional 150, maybe a little bit more for um, kids that also got the flu shot. So that was a successful event. And I think the last thing we have, we're, <clears throat> we're kind of planning for the um, Santa parade again. We've gotten a lot of requests for it. Um, the last couple of years has been highly successful. People really seem to, to enjoy it, especially this year, you know, getting out there, being able to see the you know, police and fire. We've got some new additions to the parade this year that we're not going to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, but um, it'll be a surprise for some of the people that are going to be out there watching. So that's going to be kicking off as well. And let's see what else we got. I think that's, that's it, unless you guys have specific questions. Jim, what can you say about election day and related activities? election day itself or anything related to it uh, we didn't we didn't have any issues as far as election day went we we did have some i don't even want to call them protests there were more standouts where you know supporters on on both sides would come up to 116 and 5 and 10 um that was going on for the last couple of months they were um, some people standing out holding flags and and signs and showing their support for whichever whichever candidate we did unfortunately have two incidents where there were charges um, associated with that. Um, one was a disorderly charge for somebody that taking signs away from people and throwing them in the road and getting getting in their faces and being aggressive. And another one was an attempt to run over some of the, the people that were um, executing the standout. So that, that person was, was facing multiple, multiple charges. Um, state police, were called into the area as well to try to locate state police, Deerfield police, Sunderland. We were all called into the area to locate the, uh, the individual state police did encounter that person. So, um, so they 
went forward with the charges instead of um, transitioning to, to us. You know, they're, they're facing the consequences one way or another, so. Um, Jim, were the people involved um, it, on, any, on any side in terms of the charges or people who were um, confronted with actions, uh, were they out of town or from Whateley? The, the the people that are going to be facing both. consequences. Both the people who are facing consequences and the people who um, were potentially victims of crime. Yes, they're people from Waitley on both sides. Yes. Yeah. So so it wasn't people from out of the area coming in to it was it was Waitley residents. There yeah there were Waitley residents involved at both both incidents. Um, the one individual that was getting charged for attempting to run people over, that was, I believe, a Sunderland resident. Um, the other one's a Waitley resident, and there was Waitley residents participating in the, uh, the standout that were potential victims. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, both, both parts. Jim, I, I understand the, uh, the state police was moving <laughs> ahead for any kind of incidents a couple of weeks ago uh, had a mass gathering in, Nor in Northampton. Uh, were you aware of it, involved in that, or, or notified? What, what's in the Northampton gathering? Well, it was it was at the district office, district two office in Hat Hatfield Northampton lying there. We, I mean, there's a there's a task force. Uh, the state police has a kind of a crowd control task force, if you will, where they have individuals specifically trained in dealing with um, protests that could turn violent, potentially turn violent or dealing with large crowds of people. Um, we have been in contact with them. There, There is data that gets shared via emails. I mean, there's lists of events that have been happening all over the place. So yeah, there. I mean, there was dozens of events that we've been aware of since the last couple of months since all this stuff started going on. So um, specifically being involved in it. We, we weren't involved in it. I mean, if obviously if they needed something for mutual aid and we could provide somebody, then, then we would have, but we weren't involved in, in any of operations that they had down there. So are, are you or any of your officers trained in, it, in that kind of activity? Not, not specifically in dealing with the, the protests. Um, we, we don't have any specialized training in, in those issues. Um, dealing with loud, large crowds of people, we we don't have the we don't have the equipment, we don't have the manpower to to deal with a situation like that. If it if it turned into a situation where there was hundreds of people, you know, getting violent in the streets and and Waitley, you know, our one officer with the equipment that they carry on their duty belt is is not going to to stop those issues. So we would have to. That's why they have the state police has a a task force that's available for for any town to use and they they staff individuals in each one of the barracks areas in case they need to get called out so but we we didn't need to call them out for anything i think the most we had at any of our events was maybe a couple of dozen dozen people and those were those are peaceful so the ones that were less than peaceful there was less people at so isolated events okay Anybody else have any questions for the chief? Oh, we are not. continuing the, you know, our building closure, limiting access to the to the station with um, townspeople. I mean, people can come in to report crimes. Obviously, they call ahead. We can make arrangements to <clears throat> meet them out in the parking lot or meet them at their their house. We try to deal with everything that we can outside of the police station. Um, the most traffic that we've had was the, the surge of firearms permits, firearms permit applications, I should say. So for new applicants coming in, they have to get fingerprinted. So we did have to mm -hmm. specifically make appointments for them to come in and uh, get fingerprinted, but taking all the precautions, making sure they were wearing a mask and we had gloves and masks and disinfecting and all that stuff. So um, we had a whole process for dealing with those situations as well. We have had a, a couple of arrests that we've had to deal with, you know, decontamination stuff with 
decontaminating the cruiser and decontaminating our booking room. So we've had to deal with that a couple of times. It's, it's not, uh, it's not fun. It is time consuming. I think the last, last one we had was a, it was a crash. And unfortunately the person had some injuries. So it, it took more than an hour just to clean out the, the back of the cruiser. So, and disinfect that. So, so those are always concerns as well, but obviously we have all the PPE that we need here being that everything's at the police station. So we have everything we need here to, to disinfect the, the sprays and Lysols and protective gear that we wear, face shields, goggles, gloves, masks, all that stuff that, that uh, allows us to do that. So and we are kind of still restricting as far as entering into people's houses, medical calls, things like that, unless it's life threatening, we're not, we're not entering into the houses. We're letting EMS deal with those, but we stand by in case they need our assistance for anything. Um, the, these have all been things that we've been doing since March anyways. So nothing really new as far as operations stuff goes down here at the PD, so. Okay, any uh, other questions for the chief? Anybody else? No, okay, thank you, Jim. Sure, you're welcome. Keep up the good work, keep us thank safe. You. And we'll do our best. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay, moving on. Uh, next item is uh, COVID-19, state of emergency. We've got a few items here. Uh, Brian, I guess I'll turn that over to you. Yep. So, unfortunately, over the past month, month and a half, the COVID numbers have gone the wrong way. Um, since our last meeting, we've had uh, the states taking uh, steps to kind of reel back in what's uh, what's been reopened this summer. And the two main ways that they've done that are they've reduced um, gathering sizes again, and they passed um, a mandatory mask order for all persons in all public locations um, without regard to social distancing. That's a that's a crude summary of what the of what the order is, um, and um, cases are increasing in the region. Hospitalizations are increasing in the region, and for the first time in in a little while, we we have active cases um, in town currently, um, and it's really. I really think we need to kind of sort of redouble our efforts and, and make sure that that we're doing what we need to do to stay safe while we continue to operate. Um, so with that, I wanted to take a look at the orders that we had and see what needed to be adjusted or clarified or refreshed based on um, based on real, really where we are eight, nine months into this pandemic. I know everybody's tired. Um, everybody's fatigued from it. Um, we have the holidays coming up and uh, we just wanted to sort of revisit these. Um, so the first one that we have on our list is a directive on town employees returning to work. Uh, I included I included these in the packet and I used track changes. Um, I wanted to put it into a little bit stronger language in terms of what the safety standards are. Uh, so you'll see the, the third bullet down used to say that all employees, customers and vendors um, wear, wear a, a mask when inside a building in any situation where safe, social distancing cannot be practiced. Obviously that's changed with the governor's new order. Um, so it's rewritten to reflect that. Um, hand cleaning instead of washing because we use sanitizer. Well, we have both options available, but... Um, to Brian, I noticed in, in a lot yep. of these, you, I guess interchange, I don't know, it means the same thing. Are face coverings and masks yep. both mean the same thing because one place you use them and others you, you say something different? Um, the term that we hear now is face covering. Um, so presumably if uh, face covering can be something different than a mask. Um, I'm not sure. My, my kids have something called a buff. It's a... It's a thing that you pull up um, and you pull it up over your face. It's, I don't think it's technically uh, what you would think of as an ear loop mask or mask. Um, so I think the requirement is that there be a face covering. But I, I have heard 
that there's clear data that the so-called gator masks are, or gator, gator face, face coverings are dramatically less effective than actual masks. So I guess I would wonder whether we want to have something that we, where we can control it, we mandate masks instead of gator face coverings, whatever they're called. And when we cannot, um, when we can't use actual mandates that we strongly encourage the use of face masks instead of other. Because the, the data is, is, is clear as can be. So, so my, the same thing, Jonathan, my understanding is, is that, is that it depends on the type of material that's used. It's not the, um, it's not the, the shape of the, of the material, of the mat, of the covering. It's the material that's used when they originally did the tests on the, on the neck gaiters, it was a single layer of material. Um, and what was happening was it was from my understanding of, I think we probably read the same thing, is that it was actually making larger droplets into more smaller droplets, which were suspended in the air longer. Um, since that time, I've, I've seen other studies that have said it's the type of material um, that matters. And the number of layers as well. If you take the gaiters and you add another layer, it, it makes it just as effective as a surgical mask. Okay. Yeah, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not sure we want to go into that small a detail, yeah. but do, can, is that, I think the other thing with face coverings are, um, there are things that really literally cover the whole face, like a plastic shield. Face shields, so, yeah. Um, that that I think would be something we'd want to allow. Uh, so I don't mind face covering being a more general term than a mask. Um, I, I, I certainly don't object to that. Um, my, my main question is that there's still confusion about this, even in, in places where it's been, in, it's been like for example, on campus, on Smith College campus, it's all times, all places, indoor, outdoor, social distance or not, you wear a mask unless you are alone in your office with the door closed. And it's, you know, there's, there are there just aren't any other exceptions. So whenever you're in any kind of a public place, even if you're out on Paradise Pond, you wear a mask. And this sounds to me like what we're saying is at all times when in a public location, that's kind of what we mean, right? So there would be no more, um, even if you're more than six feet apart outdoors, you need to wear a mask. And I guess to me, the question is, um, do, we, are, do we expect any compliance problems with that? And if so, what are, what's the process when someone won't wear a mask in a public place? Um, I, I, I imagine the easier is if it's an employee who refuses um, or, or just like doesn't, Keep their mask on when their boss isn't looking or something like that so so that was one question about um like this really applies to employees so what do we actually do if we have non-compliance problems with employees um, my understanding is this doesn't necessarily cover the general public who are coming because we're making a directive regarding our employees the employee the people coming to visit to do business um, are also required by the state law to wear a mask or face covering unless medically they can't. Is that, have I got any part of that wrong? Um, no, we're all covered, employees and the public and everybody's covered by the state order mm -hmm. um, regardless of, of, of whether they work for the town or not and that's enforceable. Um, through the Board of Health, and I think the fine is is five hundred dollars that um, that that can be imposed. Um, and when we when we get a little further, there's there's an additional thing about a, a mask directive um, that we should talk about. Um, okay. But 
yeah, but the the idea that the the governor the governor's order had very few exemptions. Yeah. Okay. I did, I didn't see something later about a directive at uh, at the part that I wrote that I read, but thank you. Yeah. Right. Proceed with, with your uh, guidance here, directives that you were making changes to. Yeah. So this is this is um, what I'm proposing is a second order reopening town buildings in the public for limited hours. Um, so this would supersede the um, so the. Um, well, we had the order closing, then we had the order reopening. So this would be the second one. Um, what's changed is that the the sort of the introduction here has changed to re to reflect sort of our current uh, the current status of the pandemic. Um, but really, not much as it, not much has changed in terms of in terms of the buildings that are open. It was trying to uh, clarify it, and the other ones we had really turned into four pages of dates and for elections and things like that. Um, but one talks about that really it really, really reiterates that all uh, face coverings are required in all public locations. Um, and we ask that if people are unable to wear face covering, there's still the medical exemption in the governor's order um, that they call ahead before entering a public building so that we can um, be prepared for uh, that person to provide them the services in a safe manner. Um, so in terms of trying to, to, to make it a little bit more succinct, um, number two talks about all town buildings are closed for in-person services without an appointment, um, except for the town offices in the library. Really, there's not any intended changes here. The town offices will be open the same hours and the library, as we know, is open for curbside pickup and drop off and browsing by in, um, appointment only. Where, where do we talk about schools? Is a school in here somewhere that I miss? Or? No. The school's under, I mean, the school is really in, in the control of the school committee. But it's a town building. It, it's a town building under the control of the school committee, I believe. School committee, yeah. Um, three is, talks about all town buildings are close to in-person public meetings. All boards and committees that need to meet must continue to do so remotely. Um, that's not a change from, from past practice. Um, four talks about the town hall being closed to all boards and committees in the public because uh, the board hasn't acted to change that. Uh, the part that's different is it reflects that the, that the portion of the town hall, at least the historical society, may be reopened subject to appropriate COVID-19 protocols. There was an email from uh, from Fran from the Board of Health, the Whaley Historical Society today, um, suggesting that they not allow visitors at the current moment. And I think that's, I think they're amenable to that, um, just with the rising cases and community uh, community spread. Five talks about the transfer station uh, is open, subject to COVID-19 protocols. Again, with the governor's order, um, everybody would need to wear face coverings and social, and they need to remain socially distant. And I believe that's also in the protocols of, that the Board of Health has adopted to, to operate the transfer station. And then six talks about Hurley Heath Field being open for uh, use consistent with the Commonwealth. Um, really, I was just trying to, to clean up what we had done previously and have the introduction be a little bit more timely to the current status of the pandemic. Okay. And then again, I was trying to to um, update where we are in terms of the pandemic for the introduction. Um, really, I think the, the issue with the, the original guidance that we had on this was we had a lot of language about only meet if it's essential, only meet if it's essential. Um, and right now, I think we've come to realize that, that the boards and committees are operating in a safe manner. They're operating remotely. Um, so, and there's work to be done uh, moving forward. So it, it kind of, reflects a shift in the, in that sense. Um, Ryan, just a quick question. As far as meetings, we're using Zoom. Is that something that we have a, a town account that we could all utilize if, if we decided to have a meeting? Like if I decide to have a meeting to discuss training issues with our police officers, is that something we can get access to? Absolutely, yeah. Instead yeah. of our own. 
No, you don't, you would need to set up a separate one. There's <coughs> we, can, we can hold up to two meetings at the same time on Zoom with our account. Yep. Okay. All you all you do is just shoot me an email or okay. Amy an email, and we'll set it um, up. There was in our in our open space uh, committee meeting last night. Um, because we're redoing the the plan, um, there was the conversation that that when maps are shared via computer, um, it's it's really difficult to read them because of the small the small scale. Um, there was a a question about whether one person at a time could utilize the small um meeting room going down toward you and amy's office so that table would essentially be moved 10 feet back so that so that in addition to having access to the window um if people had to do business there that those committee members only um, would arrange to see the the blown up maps um on that table in that room um and then leave and I don't know what the cleaning protocols would be or anything like that, but I I simply asked to get the opinion of you, Brian, and you know, I'll gladly accept other feedback. Um, you know, clearly it would be a more efficient thing, and we are under a, a time a timeline for that. Um, and you know, we all know that sometimes it is difficult to to really follow and understand the the, the maps when they're at the small scale on a you know my laptop is 13 inches in, in diagonal. Um, so I'm just throwing that out as is, is that one at a time, a possibility for that kind of thing, or is that just a non-starter? And I'm fine with either one. I'm just throwing out the question. But you're so, not talking about real time in the meeting, right? You're talking I mean, about, I mean, I mean, you know, somebody, somebody arranges, I'm going to come in at 11 o'clock because I want to look at this map blown up because they're doing their homework for, for meeting preparation, that yeah, kind of okay. thing. So, uh, so it would have to be in the large conference room because in order to, we needed to separate Janet and Lynn for uh, social distancing purposes. So, so <laughs> Janet's oh. office is in the small conference room, but the large conference room would be available. Um, I would think that if it's if 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 it was done one at a time and and people were masked and we knew they were coming, um, I don't think that would be an issue. I mean, we still have. Um, Boards and committee members come in and check. The, the, usually, the chairpersons come in and check the mail and those types of things. So, um, and some people during during the hours that were open, people come in and and even today, somebody was looking at at site plans for something. So, um, I don't have an issue with that. I don't know if, if the board has it's within really within the board's control, but um, I think we could do it safely. Yeah, that would sort of come under the category of you know business that people can arrange for, you know, it's it's sort of a walk-in, on a walk-in basis here, uh, calling ahead, of course, probably being a good idea in that case. But um, I don't see anything here that would need to be changed in what you wrote up to accommodate what John was saying. Okay. All right, that's good guidance. And, and thank you, Brian, for the reminder that I should probably come in and check mail once in a while. <laughs> You have stuff in your box I saw today. I'm confident of that since I haven't stepped foot in town hall in, in, a, in a month, probably. <laughs> um, so, and again, the, the original guidance for this was um, was very prescriptive. It was, you know, do this, then do this, and get the Zoom link, and then add it to the agenda, then send it to the town clerk. And I think the boards and committees have, have gotten a hang of it. Um, so in this requirement carried forward that recordings shall be sent to Amy. Um, so one thing that has come up and I mean, it really came up tonight as well is that some boards and committees, they need to have site visits. Um, they're not meetings under the definition of, of the open meeting law, but they look like a meeting and there's people together. Um, so it, I think that, that that's been happening. Um, it's not, they usually don't take place within town buildings or town property. Um, but I think um, it's good to recognize that fact that, that that's happening. Um, four talks about, again, it's just really quickly. It's not, it's not meant to be step-by-step. -step. Zoom meetings need to include a link. I mean, meeting agendas need to include a Zoom link. Um, 
requested from Amy Rye. And then again, just the a couple of reminders about how to conduct the meeting about assigning co-hosts, which I always forget till five minutes in, as Joyce probably knows, because <laughs> she gets a notification. Um, all votes need to be roll call and um, minutes and all other rules of the quorum um, apply. And again, to contact me if there's any technical issues. Um, so those are ones that uh, that we've really already had. I just tried to make them a little bit simpler and, and, and update those more. Um, and then this new one is talking about um, face coverings because it really, it, it puts public employees in a difficult position in the sense that, so for some of our employees, almost everywhere they work, almost everywhere they work is gonna be a public location. Um, so we just wanted to, I, I mean, I, I was looking for direction from the board as to, as to how do we interpret this directive? Um, and then I also, I also wanted to add something and I, and I, or I suggested that the board add something. Um, and really it's meant to, it's meant to give guidance on how you would interpret the governor's order. It so the directive is all town of Whitley employees shall wear a face covering at all times in all public locations. And when entering onto private property, when acting in an official capacity for the town of Whitley, unless an exception listed below applies. Um, so just, just to break that apart for one second, the governor's order applies to all public locations. Um, and then so a consideration for the select board is whether it wants to include something in terms of when, when folks go on, when employees go on to private property, when acting in an official capacity for the town of Waitley, um, because the governor's order would not cover that. I'm, I'm, I'm reading it a, a little bit differently. I, I think that the, the word public is seen as anything outside of a, of a residence. So even if a store is a private enterprise, obviously, it is still by this directive considered a public space. And, and I think that we should read it as such because I know that I have gone into places um, you know, literally one time I was in the wrong and I forgot to put on my mask. And as I walked in the door, I realized it and I ran out back to my car. But in that moment, they said, oh, don't worry about it. We don't care. And they weren't wearing a mask. So right. I genuinely believe that it is written so that the term public is anything that's not somebody's house or domicile. That's so, my belief. So if I was to, so if, if, if I, my town administrator duties went to your residence, went to your house, do you yeah, think the governor's think. order would require me to wear a mask when I go to your, when I go to your house? Yes. Okay. All the way up to the doorstep anyway. But no. <laughs> would it require me as a town employee also to wear a mask in my own house? when you were there. <laughs> I had actually thought about, in terms of the exceptions about listing private property not owned by the by the employee, because um, that's, it's, it's a possible situation. Um, I, I guess we're just looking, uh, we're just looking for clarification as to. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to, anybody's house in your capacity as town administrator. And this, I would presume, go to any employee who has to visit someone's house, that they should just wear a mask, even when they go in the house. I, uh, and I think that should be expected. I, so maybe, so I don't want to make an exception for if an employee goes into somebody else's house, that they don't have to wear a mask when they're inside somebody else's house just because the other person says, oh, I don't care. I think th as an employee, there I think they should be taking that precaution. We wear a mask not just to protect ourselves, but to protect other people. 
So I, I think that makes sense. I don't think, um, it, I, I agree with, I, the interpretation isn't that we're trying to say town employees, you have to wear a mask in your own house. I don't think it would be interpreted that way. I don't think it's written that way. Um, but I, I do think, you know, in the case that Jim goes into somebody's house in the line of his job, I believe you do wear per personal protective, you wear a mask, right, Jim? We do, and yes. That, that, I mean, and that's, so that's not gonna be a change for you. And I don't think it, just because someone works for a different department that that should be different for them. It's the same danger to the employees who we're also trying to protect and uh, to the general public. So it, it seems to me that that ought to be, uh, if it's not clear in here, I think that my advice would be to make it clear to, you know, the, the, the people who are supervising, the direct supervisors are people that, that yeah. There's not, now the, I think Jim's probably the most common of our employees who might have to go into someone's house. Uh, although you've arranged your protocols, so you don't go in unless you absolutely have to. Um, who else? That's, that's for medical, for medical calls, yeah. For medical calls. Um, then, um, like who else might have to go into a private residence? Well, the fire department, the fire department. Fire department? Go in there as well for um, fire alarm, yeah. carbon monoxide detectors. Right. Yeah. Are, that, are assessors making home visits these days? No. No? What what what's to me seems contentious here is when acting in an official capacity. What what is is that mean during normal working hours? I mean, if if Keith stops at my house at six o'clock in the evening and brings me a jug of maple syrup, is is that does he have to wear a mask to do that? Well, Fred, I would argue since you guys are both visible town officials and, and, and leaders and leaders lead by example, I would, I, I would say that Keith should be wearing a mask if he brings you a, a, a jug because, because people watch. Okay. And I, I imagine he's going that, through but, some, yeah, he's going but, through some public space to get to you but as well. I, 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 I have no problem with that, Jonathan, but I don't see that happening in town. I think, I'm not sure it's public officials, but I see our town employees, sometimes I see them going to private residence without wearing any masks now. Sometimes during the day, sometimes weekends or whatever. And I don't know how, would, how or who would enforce it. I mean, people, there's people that don't wear masks, period. So no matter what you tell them or, or, or if you approach them, they're not going to wear a mask. Yeah, no, but that means they're, they're just obeying the state law, right? Yeah. If it's, uh, and it's all persons are required to wear face coverings in all public locations. Yeah. Okay, that's, so I, I agree there are people who are not going to comply with the, uh, with the state orders. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, I guess the question at hand here is when we're putting our guidance here, right? Is that was, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, this uh, directive on face coverings for town employees. Sorry, I was reading the wrong document. Here, we as kind of the authority have, have something to say about that. And I, you know, I, I, we're not asking them to do anything that's inconsistent with with what the state's requiring. So I don't have any problem with 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 just reinforcing that by saying that if you're if you, especially if you're on you're doing something on behalf of the town, yes, for goodness sake, wear a face covering, protect yourself, protect your neighbors. And and I, and I think that it, it goes. It has to be driven home even more. It, it's, you know, we're getting into the, if you go into somebody's home, of course, but, you know, if there's a power outage in town and, you know, I, I wasn't down on 510 the other day, but 
I'm going to guess that not everyone was wearing a face mask. Um, and, and that's wrong. Um, and we're going to have, you know, ice storms create power outages. And if that happens, when, when things happen, everybody should be wearing a face mask. But I bet my last dollar that not everyone was wearing a mask when those lines were being put back up and the trees were being removed on State Road the other day. Yeah. Well, this is relatively new. The, uh, yes, the same, the same question. Maybe Keith would know that fixing the railroad crossing, was everybody there wearing a mask? No, all the workers there were not wearing masks. Right. It just so, what, what what good are we doing if we're going to have this conversation and then I'm, and then not enforce anything? Well, like in that situation, I mean, it was a there was a at one point in time, probably between the railroad personnel and the contractors, there was probably ten to twelve people all within you know, within close proximity of each other. And so who's who's going to enforce that? I mean, those are private. It's, yeah. They're not town employees. They're it's not a private place. Well, it's on town property. Well, maybe. But this is, this is a directive for employees. Right. Right? Uh, our, so in that scenario, it would be our overburdened health agent who would who was supposed to enforce that. Yeah. But it, I, I think for our own like liability, I mean, I, I, I think we should, because I think it'd be irresponsible to say otherwise. I like, I'm even looking at this where it says, you know, employees may remove their face covering when necessary to communicate by or with a person who has a hearing impairment or other disability. I'm a little shaky on that. I think you know, there's gotta be another way to communicate without taking off your mask. Um, so so uh, I, on, on number three, I think it ought to be if your door is closed and not just if you can maintain six feet from others in your own workspace. Because that's, I think that's kind of against the spirit of, of what they, I mean, I'm, I keep going back to the original one. All persons are required to wear face coverings in all public locations including but limited blah, 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 blah. And this was irrespective of social distancing, right? So I don't think our advice, our direction to our employees should say, well, if you're six feet apart, it's okay to take off your mask, you know, in this place that is not your private residence. It's public in the sense that there may be more than one person using the space. I mean, if you're alone in a room with the door closed, to me, that's the only exception that I know of that 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 any employer has used for when you can go without a mask. So the reason that's worded how it was, when this originally came out, I had asked uh, Fran for an opinion um, mm -hmm. from from DPH about about um, public buildings and public workplaces, and the response that he got was that if if a portion of the building is if a portion of a public building is closed to the public, they don't interpret that as being in, in a public location. Just legalese for you, huh? Mm. But but all all sidewalks everywhere are public. I don't I don't disagree with 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 your recommendation I, though. I I don't know. There's that you know that hallway behind the table. There's you, there's Amy, and there's Janet now there. Yep. Okay. That hallway is a public place. Right. <laughs> well, the hallway is close to the public. No, but it's but but you three are all public. You know, you I mean you're do you know what I mean? But you all have doors. So if that's the problem area, then we say, look, with the door closed. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not as comfortable as, uh, you know, it, if we're really saying in all public, I, I don't, I don't get that that's not really a public place, given that even if you're outdoors on a sidewalk, 
and you're maintaining more than six feet, you're supposed to be wearing a mask, right? So I, I guess I'm not as comfortable with those. Um, I keep scrolling down to find the right exceptions there. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with Joyce on that. I, I, what we do if we don't have what Joyce is saying, we have gray area. And, 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 and nebulous gray area is, is just not the right place for public policy. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess if, if we change three to and has your, have your door closed, then I would be okay with three if we change it from and can maintain six feet. And I think it should be with a door closed. If you're the only person in any room and all the doors are closed, then yeah. But if not, wear a mask. Wear a mask. Um, I, I, I imagine that the disability one probably I'm I'm wrong on that. Um, it occurs to me that people who lip read might not be able to understand you unless you have one of the special clear masks or something, or you're using a face shield instead of a mask. I, uh, I don't know, maybe a face shield would be uh, an alternative for that situation where someone has a hearing impairment. I think they might be able to hear better uh, with the face mask because there's more room for, um, for sound waves to get around. Um, but I guess I'm not that comfortable with three. Um, and driving a vehicle or equipment alone and can maintain six feet distance from, I can't understand, well, I don't understand driving something and not being six feet away from everybody else. Can you be alone in a vehicle and maintain 16? I mean, maybe there's examples um, that Keith could say of when you're in a piece of equipment driving it, but you're also within six feet of another person who's not in the vehicle with you. No, you know? I, no. <clears throat> Anytime we're any of us are driving a vehicle, we're more than six feet of, unless we have two people in a vehicle. Right. That's so different. On number four, you're driving a vehicle or other type of equipment alone. Period. Right. I mean, like and can main. I mean, is there equipment where you can? I can imagine some like some some equipment that you're you're using. I mean, construction. I, I guess construction. Right. I guess you could be operating a, um, a tractor and have someone come and walk up to you. So you're technically mm -hmm. still operating the tractor. And in that case- But they're out on a public sidewalk, so they gotta wear a mask. So, <laughs> and what about a fire truck? You know, in the fire trucks, they, um, firefighters, when they get in the truck, you're gonna be less than six feet apart. Yeah, the mask would be appropriate. Right. I mean, even if they weren't six feet apart in the same truck, they should be wearing a mask. It just they should right. be. You know, if if the if the rule covers people like outside on sidewalks that are more than six feet apart have to wear a mask, then I don't see how any of these directives should have anything with six feet. It has nothing to do with it anymore. Right. If you're driving with somebody in a, in a vehicle, you're wearing a mask. Yeah, or even, with, yeah, so. Mask. It's like being in, in your office. Like if you're in an enclosed vehicle, that's like having one great big mask. But if, so if employees who are driving an enclosed vehicle alone, I can imagine that that would be probably a safe time to take off your mask, but you know, if you're alone in a vehicle that's enclosed, then, you know, <laughs> literally you're, you're inside the mask, right? But I, I, I'm not comfortable with the can maintain six feet of distance because that's, that's been tossed, right? That's been tossed with the, the, the more general law, the more general guidance that we have, which is at all times in all public places, regardless of six feet distance. So I think we got to take out the six feet. But I could see where you're operating a, a piece of equipment and other people are within six feet. I can see that that happening. 
Yeah, then you should be wearing a mask. That's right. the whole point. That let's not make it. We don't need to make an exception for that. That's that's already covered. Okay, maybe, maybe we need to scroll scroll up to what this these four conditions are about. I guess I'm losing track. Exceptions. Okay. Um, you know, I'm gonna. I and I think this should be town employees and contract workers personally. I think we should be very clear. And I get, and 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 part of the reason I want to include part contract workers is to is to take the awkwardness away from. I'll use Keith's crew as, as my example. If if Keith's crew is working. Um, with, with other people who are working on behalf of the town to do something, that's a very awkward position to put them in. They're wearing masks and no one else is. If you're doing work as a contract worker in Waitley, put on a mask. It's the law. And if we let people, it's a state law. If we let people go without wearing a mask in those kinds of situations, we are condoning breaking the law. I would be careful calling it a law though, because you're not breaking the law. You're breaking guidance from the governor. Isn't there a $500 fine I thought I saw? But it's, it's not a law. It's being disputed. There's, there's all kinds of litigation going on as far as enforcement of this stuff goes. And I, I can see it being an issue. We're, do, we're doing a lot of police details and we've got tree crews and, you know, our officers are going to have to stand there with a, with a mask on on the road now. Now we're going to have to argue with the, the tree crew to put masks on. It, it's just going to put it, people in a, a bad spot. We're going to argue with the guy operating a loader. We're going to go down there and yell at all the guys working on the railroad crossing. We're going to, are we going to kick them out of town if they don't, you know, we're not going to get the work done if, if they refuse to wear a mask. If they refuse to wear a mask, are we going to sick the Board of Health on them? I, I think mm -hmm. there's more issues there than just, it's not as simple as just saying, put on a mask, because some people are going to say, screw you. Well, I think, okay. uh, Jim, you're, you're right that people who are being hired to do things that we're not paying for, right? A tree yeah. crew is coming out on behalf of Comcast or... or yeah. But they're doing work the on a public, public right. way I didn't see it. <clears throat> But I think the place where we can have a directive telling people to do something is if we're footing the bill. Mm -hmm. So if we hire a contractor to work with Keith on something on the road, that's one thing. We didn't. We don't actually sign the paycheck for the people who do the railroad crossing. We have limited power. So I, I, agree. I agree with you that there's a lot of situations where we have very limited power. But the places where we do have some power, I think we should try to exercise it. And maybe we don't have a lot of contractors working with us in the next few months. <clears throat> I don't know, uh, because I think most of Keith's work uh, with contractors ends up being in kind of in the, in the building and construction season. Um, but I could be wrong about that. But if we hire a contractor to do something, then we're paying the bill, then it's our rules. Then that's, I, I think that's, that's where we have the power, so that's where we should exercise it. And we should understand that we don't have power over everything. Though I'll admit, and, and, and again, I, 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 I'll get off my soapbox because this meeting's getting way too long. But, you know, when I walked into that store and was told, we don't, you know, don't worry about it. I, I guarantee you, I let the people who owned that company know that that was the, the, that was the, the perspective of their employees. And if I came across people who were taking down trees and they weren't, wearing Max, I guarantee you, I would be in touch with the owners of that company. Now they may laugh at me and that's fine, but 250,000 people have died in this country in nine months. Yep. And if someone wants to turn their, their head on that, you know what? I, I hope they can sleep well at night. So I'll stop because I, I, get, I get really fired up about it. Okay, where are we, where are we going here, Brian? Do we need to make so, changes or what? What's going on? Well, so let me let me give a little background on on some of these exceptions. Um, so exception one is, and some of these are from the governor's order, um, that talks about medical or other disabling condition, um, and it gives employers and schools the right to um, 
um, request proof of um, the medical condition or other disabling condition. Um, so when I when I presented this to the Board of Health, they requested that um, we add the language about but may required but may be required to take other precautions, wearing a face shield or mandatory social distancing. Number two comes from the governor's order as well. Um, and I think that's verbatim. And I think it addresses what Joyce talked about in terms of lip reading. Um, um, three had to do with uh, the response that I got from Fran about um, closed workspaces. I think my recommendation would be if we're not comfortable, um, and I actually think the and can maintain six feet of distance from others was a recommendation from the Board of Health, but I agree that it, I don't know that it makes a lot of sense um, if we wanted to amend that, if they're working alone in their own workspaces with doors closed. Um, I think that's a good possibility. And the intent for number four here, there's also an exemption from, from the governor's order about employers who are driving a vehicle um, um, inside a vehicle um, alone or with other household members, but we shouldn't have household members in our um, yeah. vehicles when we're working for the town. Um, the idea of maintaining the six feet was to try to, uh, and maybe we don't want to do it, was give a little latitude in terms of, uh, I was thinking about if, if somebody's driving on one of the riding lawn mowers or someone's driving the backhoe or, um, something like that where they're they're alone uh but there's people i guess it would, i guess there could be people around um so the 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 governor's order just talks about vehicles mm -hmm. um and i guess i was trying to provide a little latitude if they were on a different piece of equipment where somebody's like not likely to be around if you're mowing the lawn, it's not likely somebody's gonna come up to you, but I guess they could. Um, so that's that was the intent there. Okay, going back to number one there, Brian, the, uh, you, it says, uh, but maybe required to take other precautions. Yeah. Why, why don't we say, you're required to take other precautions. I mean, that means you don't have to do anything if for medical. You can, you can still do, well, maybe not a, I don't know, face shield, but you can do social distancing. Was, was that direct from the governor's directive? Um, it says where a person is unable to wear a mask. So this, so it's exceptions. The face covering requirements in section one shall not apply in the following circumstances. A, where a person is unable to wear a mask or cloth face covering due to a medical or disabling condition, provided that a person who declines to wear a mask or cloth face covering because of a medical or disabling condition should not be required to produce documentation except as provided in section three. And that talks about schools and employers having the right to request um, medical condition. That, 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 language starting but may be required was a recommendation from the Board of Health. This but may be required is the same thing as not, this is not actually required. No. Right. <laughs> um, so, but may be required, like under what conditions would might you be required? That's pretty vague. It doesn't seem like it adds anything. No. Yep, so I mean, we could change made a shout. I think that makes more sense because otherwise they're not offering, I guess, any protection. Right. And yep. disability shouldn't prevent you from doing some kind of social distancing. Yeah. It's the disabilities regarding the mask. Yep. Okay. This is for non-school, right? Because we don't want to we don't want to get in the middle of 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 
students who need one-on-one um, -on -one teacher's aides, because that certainly is not going to be within six feet, so. Right, and yeah, then I guess this just goes for, <coughs> yeah. Right, and it, part of the governor's order also, it, it's, it's, it includes as exception D about where applicable sec sector specific COVID-19 safety rules issued by one of the state agencies applies. Um, so in those situations where the face covering is allowed to be removed, those sector specific guidelines trump the order. So you can take off your mask while you're eating. Um, it, it, it talks about the regulations from, from DESE. Um, so in those situations, in those sector specific workplaces, the existing guidance would, would trump that's a terrible uh, choice of word, but yeah. um, would supersede uh, the governor's order. Right. Okay. Let's move on. So you'll make that change here to shall be required. Right? I can make the change to shall. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And then also on three. Yeah. Um, what if. Um, I got it. I have it partially covered. Um, if they're working alone in their own workspace with the door closed and then delete yeah. the rest of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that, that would be it for the, any of the updates to the orders. Yeah. Or I mean, no, number four seems nonsensical, but I don't. Oh, we, we could. <laughs> But but I like I, I can't I can't repair it. It's so it's kind of nonsensical. It, it only makes sense in the context of, you know, you might be able to be driving a vehicle and someone might be able to come within six feet of you, but it doesn't make any sense because the word alone is there. That's to me that's more important than trying to figure out whether someone can get six feet from you. So yeah, but we should probably employees who are driving a vehicle alone just simplify it. Yeah, right. but then, because then it makes me wonder why is the other one there, and like when I there are a lot there's lots of open vehicles where so if you're in this vehicle and you're alone in the vehicle, then someone could be six feet from you. I'm maybe that but, can happen. So I don't really object to keeping it there. Um, depends on what I. I, I well, I think they could be outside the vehicle and, and within six feet of you. Yeah. Right, and if the vehicle's not enclosed, then you're not in a mask. So uh, I, I think we should leave it. Okay. Um, I, uh, although, you know, to me, the contradiction is more that two people on a sidewalk, 10 feet apart, both have to wear a mask. Someone's in a vehicle, some kind of equipment, someone can get all the way up to six feet, you don't have to wear a mask. Presumably that person who's out there on the sidewalk, they have to wear a mask. <laughs> so uh, I guess to me, I it, kind of in keeping with the door closed part, I would say driving a an enclosed vehicle or other type of enclosed cab um, alone, then you don't have to worry about the six feet because you're enclosed, right? I mean, that makes more sense to me than saying, well, nobody else can do the six feet thing when you're outdoors. Oh, unless you're you're in a vehicle that maybe doesn't even have any windows or doors, right? I'm trying to do something that makes sense. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> there, are, there are, the number, the situations are, uh, there's a lot of contradictions in, in yeah. situations where you kind of scratch your head and, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I feel like the word enclosed should be there and then scratch the can maintain six feet of distance from others. But it does, it does say vehicle or any type of other equipment or other type of equipment. Right. So it so should be in, enclosed other type I'm, of equipment. I think we're getting too specific there. Yeah, I think it's 
You're going to get into what is enclosed mean? No windows, doors? I don't know. Windows, but no doors? Well, yes. If, if, if you don't have windows or doors, that would not be considered enclosed. And I understand that this means that that means someone riding a lawnmower would have to wear a mask. And they're likely to run over anybody who gets within six feet of them anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. but he, and they're I mean, mowing in a public area. Right. right. So that's. Okay. I'm going to throw out there that, that you know, as, as we hire a town administrator to create policy that, or to, to, to best ascertain what is going to keep people safe and follow the law. Um, I got to tell you, I, I am completely okay with letting Brian make these determine, you know, create this policy as he sees fit as our town administrator. That's just me. Right. Although he is asking for our input right now. Well, I know, but I, we can always throw it back and say, you know what, you've gotten our input. Now you decide. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So, so in terms of, I mean, for, for tonight's purposes, I mean, what the request is, is that we would that we would adopt these orders as written or as amended um, to replace our previous ones. Okay. And that would be within the authority of the, of the select board. Are, are we done with all the orders and can we, we can make a motion to accept Brian? Um, I've covered the ones that I have, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll make a motion to Accept the revisions to these COVID-19 state of emergency orders as presented with the amendments that we have discussed this evening. Is that specific enough for you, Brian? Yeah, and to adopt the new uh, directive on face coverings. Okay, and adopt the new directive on face coverings. I'll second that. Okay, roll call vote, Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred, yes. Okay. Uh, Brian? Just a, just a question, maybe I could ask Keith. Um, are you guys all set with masks? I still have, um, the supply's getting low, but I'm. we still have some. Okay, because this is, this is definitely gonna require wearing more masks. So it's gonna yes. require more PPE, so. Maybe if Brian could put something out to other town departments to stock up. We do have supplies of uh, surgical masks and KN95 masks in the thousands. So we can get those out. Okay, moving on. Next item is Post Cares Act. Discuss ongoing and new activities that may require funding um there's really not I, I don't really have much to discuss with, that that needs to be discussed tonight but just just i wanted to just throw out the idea that that absent any action at the federal level the the cares act money that we have is going to expire um uh, december 30th um so if we have ongoing expenses that that we may incur um thoughts were if we're continuing a senior meals program something like that um uh, we may need to find alternative sources um, for those programs, um, additional PP if we if this um, if this continues to drag on, this being the pandemic, uh, we may have additional costs in terms of PP and cleaning supplies. Um, hopefully, we can take care of much of that within our budget. But um, I, you just wanted to, to to bring that up that 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 money that we have right now may may disappear. Um, and Fred, just the other item before that was about the status of reopening the town oh. hall. Oh, okay. um, so at the last meeting, there was discussions about about um, a, a request to reopen the town hall, with and the an email came sub, um, subsequent to that meeting, um, saying that 
uh, that person thought it would be more up to the Board of Health and the and the town itself to to develop policies for reopening the town hall. Um, well, I while I think that that's probably true in terms of in terms of reopening the town hall, uh, my own personal opinion is that I don't really think it's an appropriate time uh, to reopen the town hall based on the the current trends that we have with with COVID nineteen. But um, that's a decision of the board. Um, if, if if that's something that you want me to work on with the board of health, we can. Um, but I, I just think we need to keep in mind that if that really, if we if we reopen it to to one person or one group, it, it really needs to be re reopened to um, anybody who wants to use it. Um, and we have people have asked. Um, it was several weeks or months ago when numbers were a little bit better, uh, but we told them that the the, the town hall has been closed. Um, so I guess I'm just looking for direction as to what what you want me to do. I guess my, my thoughts are with you know the, the directives we and orders we just passed uh, that applies to all town buildings and and all groups uh, using town buildings. Uh, I don't see any reason to make an exception for for a private group or individual at this time. Yeah, I sadly, I, I, I kind of agree. It's too early to try for a general reopening. I think in six months, we should relook at that and see if uh, see if it looks like there's a better prospects for oh, being able to reopen safely. I agree. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, okay, moving on. Uh, old business. The uh, first one is discuss snow removal from town owned properties and sidewalks on Chestnut Plain Road and consider awarding contracts for snow clearing and treatment. And Brian provided us with some uh, information on, on past expenses and uh, proposals that he received. Okay, Brian. So, so we put it. We put out our needs. We put them out to bid in two different groups. One was group one town buildings. One was group two sidewalks. And we um, requested um, bids be submitted for each group. Uh, each group. Um, we re we received um, really well. When it breaks down, we received two bids for each, um, and that's what's shown on the screen right now. Um, Unfortunately, one of the bidders that we got, it wasn't on the bid form um, and we gave them a chance to correct and we never heard back from them. Um, so we really have, we really have just one bid for each. Um, group one town buildings would, would be um, hmm. JD Ross. And then for group two, the sidewalks would be um, John Hannum. So you're seeing total numbers here. And those are total numbers based on um, really for bidding purposes. You see it uh, states their actual payment to the contractors on a per storm basis. Um, and it's, let me flip this back. So this is the sidewalk one. Um, and it's based on, on three inch, three inches of snow. Um, so for each, um, so for, for instance, it's not included here, but it talks about zero to three inches. Um, so we, it would cost us $350 to have that, um, sidewalks cleared. These are the Chestnut Plain Road sidewalks. Um, and this would be the cost for the, as the storms get bigger. Um, you can ignore the treating, the 150 for treating, because, um, my understanding from Keith is that we're not going to do treating, um, so that's really our option. If we're going to hire um, a private contractor to clear the sidewalks, um, and it would be just clearing them after the storm has finished, um, that's the rate that we would be paying, um, $350 to $500 per storm. Um, hey, Brian. Yep. Let me ask this. Um, and maybe Keith's already got to answer this, but does that mean that 
um, nothing would be started until the storm is over. Unlike the plowing of streets happens continuously throughout the storm. Um, the, re the snow removal from sidewalks, you know, do you, you know, how, how is that? How is that defined? If you're going to do it this way, if it snows for four, if it snows four to six inches, and then stops, and five hours later starts again, and snows another four to six inches. Well, you're up to twelve inches. Are you paying three fifty? Are you paying four fifty? You're doing three fifty twice, and then four fifty or four fifty once. All right, that's sort of the point. Or is it considered one storm where they got ten to twelve inches? And it's again, it's a gray area that I think we need to figure out what's considered as how do you delineate between one storm for the, from the next in regards to when the like other towns that have their own equipment they they have waited until the streets are completely done and then they go out and do it so i understand what you're saying but in for the most part i think it's pretty easy to define when a storm ends um if, if we get a second round of a storm like a day later, that would be considered a second storm. I, I think it's it's more critical for the, the town buildings. I mean, the sidewalks can probably wait till the end of the day or next day. It's more critical for the town buildings. And, and maybe yes. ask Brian, right now, when or prior years for the town buildings, did they come more than once when a storm was going on? And would do we just pay for the storm just one time, even though they were there more than once? Um, well, the bit <laughs> the billing wasn't very consistent, but they would show up multiple times um, right. if it were long duration, and they would show up at the end to clean it up. Yeah, well, and then they would determine their rate based upon total snow accumulation, even if it was several, even if it was a multi-step removal process um i'd have to go back and look keith do you remember what what billy did i all i know is he would show up multiple you know when bigger storms happen he'd show up multiple times i don't know how he was billing it wouldn't it just be total accumulated snowfall for that storm that's what i would say Eight inch yes. storm or a 10 inch storm, you wouldn't charge multiple times for coming. Well, yeah, when um, when he bills from my house, that's how it just shows up. Total number of inches and it's a different rate for different storms. Uh, I, I'm just looking at- Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I, I'm just so shocked at the difference in price between what we've paid in the past three years and what these estimates are. And I understand we don't pay unless we have the storms, right? So, and, and they're based on estimates of number of storms. So, but um, gosh, that really seems, it's like an order of magnitude, <laughs> approximately difference in, um, I mean, we don't, we haven't done sidewalks in the past, but, but for the town building, $16,000 is the estimate and in the past, two thousand dollars was a big year. Right, sixteen um, does seem steep. I agree with Joyce. It, but but I don't know if it, it could well be, and maybe other people have knowledge that would back me up. Maybe we were just getting a really good deal from yeah. from Bill Smith. Yeah, uh, but that then, that could what, be. Okay, what what's I guess maybe it surprised me, both of these kind of had similar ranges for the flat rate bid. Show the other one quick, Brian, from Ross. Was it, unless I'm mistaken, was it, well, see, it's 369, okay, but the lower ones. Uh, and and if, you look, if you look at, uh, this was for, Snow clearing and treatment for the, the three three hundred dollars. I mean, if, it, if it, I don't know what the going rate, labor rate. That's thirty, say thirty dollars an hour. That person is there ten hours. Well, plus you got equipment in there. I guess some equipment expense. 
Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, the the other the other thing I I, I looked at, or I think maybe we should consider is, is for the town sidewalk where you, where you got John Annam submitted a bid is is well for one that's not as critical I guess as, as the town buildings, but uh, if the town could do that, and we don't have the, the way the way for the town to do that would be to buy some equipment e and either a, you can, a, a fairly good size commercial walk behind snowblower that you, you can get for uh, anywhere from three to $4,000, or you can have an attachment to a lawn or garden tractor for roughly $2,000 or even less. And if the town either keeps crew or say the Syrian Dairy Commission is in need of buying a lawnmower and lawn tractor, uh, maybe this would be something to consider to buy the tractor with a snowblower attachment to use to clean the, 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 the sidewalks here. Uh, and then of course, you gotta decide whether, you know, Keith's crew is, is capable, well, available to do that uh, or hiring somebody else to do that. Uh, and of course, we would own the equipment, and and it would be our responsibility to do it rather than John, I, I guess. I mean, the only comment I can make in regards to a walk behind snowblower to to wait until the storm is over, yeah, and be looking at ten or twelve inches, and to do three thousand feet, you're talking probably it could be a couple of days worth of labor for an employee to it. it when all that snow gets frozen and everybody's driveways that are being plowed, all that snow is going to be hard packed. A walk behind snowblower is not going to even touch some of that stuff. I mean, it, it would work fine in a powdery, fluffy snow, but in wet snow, heavy, or in our case, you know, when we do it, we wouldn't be able to go and do it until after we're done plowing. Right. And so many times after it's done plowing, the temperature is plummeted and the slush that was all soft one one minute is all frozen solid and we won't we wouldn't be able to do it with a walk behind snowblower the towns that have the equipment they have to some the towns will end up some storms they'll take their plow off of their machine that they use and they'll put a blower on because it's light and fluffy then when you get to the storms where the snowblower can't cut through it they have to put the plow back on and and go through that so they they're always um changing up on how they they handle it um as far as certainly the town we don't the town doesn't even own a tractor that you could put a snowblower on all the mowers that the you know the cemetery has now and that you know we have are all zero turn mowers they're not meant for they're not like garden tractors to put snowblowers on Okay, do, do we know what equipment John would use for this? He has a, um, he has a commercial size tractor. Yeah, that, that would fit, that would probably pretty, pretty accurately fit the sidewalks. With a snow Yeah, blower? I think he, he's got a commercial tractor with a cab on it. With a snow blower or just a plow? Um, I believe. I know he was talking about buying a, a snow blower. I don't know exactly what he has at the moment i'm not sure he certainly has a plow yeah well, and and can remove and, and move you know pick up piles but mm -hmm. just to answer um a couple questions um i was looking at the the proposal that we had from from bill smith for the for the prior years and um Treating and clearing it, it's about half um, as to what these bids were. Um, so one to four inches treating and clearing would have been 160. Um, five to nine would have been 180, and then nine plus inches would have been 200. dollars um, So these proposals are are more expensive. Um, in terms of in terms of the totals, um, I think he gave us a good deal. Um, in terms of how he build and, and when he build. 
And I dare even say if he build, um, I think I think we were very fortunate. Um, mm. And I mean, the reason he gave us as to why he couldn't do it is because he says it's really difficult to find um, laborers to do this. And he says he can make, it's, I think it's just the truth, he can make more money with somebody in a truck and a snowplow doing driveways than he can have paying somebody to, to shovel and snowblow. Um, that just sort of gave us a sense right. of what what the what the market is out there or, or, or what we can expect. Right. Um, I mean, it, it, Brian, what you're saying. I mean, when you look at the numbers we have, it almost means that the, he could probably make the money, but he's got to raise the rates dramatically, which brings you up to like the numbers that we're seeing from from JD. What kind of hours are we talking about? Per storm, is there an average? Is there a, a you know? You do this, Keith. What? Um, I would probably guess um, a cup, probably two to two to yeah, a good two hours to do it each time. But you're also looking at um, mo you know, mobilizing things. If if he's doing it with a walk, if they're doing it with a small walk behind snowblower in conjunction with a um, shoveling. And they're moving. They got to have their um, spreader that they use to spread the the salt treatment. There, you're going to need to mobilize that stuff. You got to load it onto either truck and trailer every single time. It's Are not we like talking about sidewalks there. now, sidewalks or town buildings now? I'm talking to town buildings every time okay. they, because um, I I certainly, you know, when it comes to the town office from the parking lot to the building is pretty small. That there, I would say they could just shovel. But when it comes to the walkway in between the town hall and the post office and out in front in the walkways at the library, they would probably look at using a small snowblower. Well, every time you have to move that, you've got to load it onto a vehicle and move it around. It's not going to be left there, so that's so an expense. Include, keep include that in the hours. Then, how many hours are we talking about? Then we can, you know, I'm I'm going to just throw out that number that two to two to three hours to to do everything once. The town buildings, not the sidewalk. Yes, town buildings. Two to three hours. That's let's use three hours. A three inch storm. That's going to be done. That's a hundred dollars an hour. You got a you got, you got a lot of liability insurance. Insurance. The employee uh, that they're paying the uh, workers' comp on the employee. I mean, plus I, mean, I, I get. I'm just saying it's hundred dollars an hour. It's less than what the state charges. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, let me say the the uh, the town buildings and stuff, sidewalk. This includes. Keith mentioned the sidewalks between post office and town hall. The sidewalk in front of the town hall, the sidewalk along the Veterans Memorial, to along the parking lot, and also the sidewalk from the library down to the parking lot on Chestnut Plain. All right, Correct. includes all them sidewalks. Okay. Does it include anything at the police station? Just just out of curiosity, because I know Wayne's done it in the past, and it sounds like we're hiring somebody to do it all instead of using our town employees. And we're buying you a shovel. Yeah. I, I've already got one. I shovel it every year, every storm. <laughs> that's that's why I'm asking if it's going to be covered on the police station too, with that plowing and the... Well, Wayne, Wayne will still do the plowing. I, Brian, I don't think you, you did not include the police station for shoveling, did you? No, I just included those three buildings. Okay, that's just for shoveling then? For what, that amount? Yeah. That's just for, yeah, that does not include the parking lots. Okay. Uh, I mean, okay. in terms of, in terms of the budget that we have for, for town operation, for the town buildings account, I mean, we used, uh, we carry $3,000 a year. Um, we would go through this and if we had two big storms, we would go through this budget. Yeah. Um, 
So if we were to accept really either quickly. since we've got to find, I mean, even say we decide, you know, well, sidewalks, we don't have enough money for that. We're still in trouble just with town buildings. That's about the estimate here for the season is like three times. Uh, no, more than three times. Uh, five times what we've got budgeted, right? Yes. So yeah, I mean, the I mean these estimate amounts are are. You know, I don't think we're going to hit these estimate amounts, but right. it's just a way to compare bids. Um, but yeah, we. We yeah. budgeted for what our costs were when when Bill was doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And what's our total snow removal budget? Uh, for my winter roads, I don't have that in front of me. I couldn't tell you. Can we pay for this out of winter roads? The I, I had talked to Brian in regards to um, the the sidewalks, which. It could. Um, I guess it. the the other snow clearing in front of the sidewalks. It could be the same thing. But there again, just remember that none of my budget has that budgeted in. Yeah. And as long as the finance committee is well aware of it being added in, so when I come knocking on their door, out of money, they'll know. Thanks. Where did where did we pay uh, Billy Smith for? for? What account did his come from? The town buildings operation. We we carry um, in our budget. We include three thousand okay. dollars a year, and that's that was just for town buildings. Um, last in twenty twenty one, the request for for winter roads a total was a total of one thirty seven. Um, oh sixty eight, so one hundred thirty seven thousand dollars. And that's about average what you've been spending? Yes. Roughly, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I guess by delaying this, I, I don't know if we're, we're gaining anything other than taking a chance it's going to snow or when it's going to snow. Uh, yeah. And if we reject all bids and, and advertise again, you may not get any or different ones, I, I guess. So I, I, I know it could be a big expense and that's, if it snows a lot like you're projecting here, I, I, I think we should, we should go with these two and see what happens. Uh, maybe a learning experience the first year and we can work on it after that if they really get out of line and, and advertise again or see what else we can do. Do we have a sense of what other towns are paying? All I can tell you is, you know, I j had just talked to Sunderland and Deerfield do their own with the sidewalks. I don't know what they do in regards to shoveling town buildings. Okay. And, and I would guess other, other towns have a lot more sidewalks than we do. Yes. And Definitely. Uh, Brian, Brian, you had reached out to your town administrators. Did they give you anything in regards to, do you remember in that? No, the majority of them did it, did it in-house. Yeah. Um, no, but I'm talking the show, you did, you were only looking at sidewalk maintenance. You weren't talking to them about shoveling oh. town buildings, were you? No, I guess I assume that if they're doing the sidewalks in house, they were doing town buildings in house, but that may not be true. Yeah, and I really look at it as two different things because the the sidewalks can wait until a storm is over, whereas right. in front of the post office, when it's open and it's snowing like crazy, somebody needs to be there to shovel it during during the storms as it's happening. And is is that part of the these contracts, Brian, to do it as occurring? Is there any language in there like that? For the the way that it was written for the for the Chestnut Plain Road sidewalks, it was going to be end of storm. Um, and but for the for the town buildings group, it was going to be, um, I think it was every three inches or whenever called out by the, um, whenever called out by Keith. Okay. Um, 
Do we, I mean, uh, my sense is we're not going to get anything cheaper for the sidewalks. Um, yeah. But I, I, I don't necessarily feel the same way about um, the town buildings. Do we, my concern is budgetary. The yeah. uh, school is paying for, I assume they hire somebody or is that part of their maintenance crew? The custodian does the school. Custodian yeah. does it? Yeah. Yeah, I believe they have a, I don't know, some kind of a walk behind, but it's a really wide uh, sort of snow blower. Right. And he, he's there, the custodian's there, and he stays with the storm. He works with the storm. So he does, it's not like he waits. Right. It's being done multiple times during a storm event. And they, and again, the equipment doesn't have to be moved, it's stored right there. So all the, all, everything's there. Yeah. And and Keith, remind me again why you guys just don't do the 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 town parking lots. As far as plowing them, yeah, because um, our equipment is just not meant to do the tight, narrow spaces in between. You know, so and it had always been done by a pickup, and when the water department was created, it was a reason for to justify at that time having 20 hours a week for the water department. Um, and while the water department has obviously justified more hours per week and, and Wayne does more hours per week, um, his equipment, you know, still having the, the small plow, it does pretty good in, the, in those areas. Yeah. Well, then, is that another option to say have Wayne or some other town employee be responsible for the buildings, throwing snow around the buildings? Again, it's it's something that would have to be done during during the event, and and it's not something where when it's snowing hard out, I can't I can't park trucks and not plow roads to go shovel, and so. Yeah. That's where oh, yeah. it becomes an issue. So what I'm hearing is you don't really have enough personnel to deploy someone with a shovel at the same time as you're doing roads. You, you don't have enough employees. That is correct. And you know, the fact that the town doesn't hire outside contractors, it, you know, to help plow the roads, we do all the roads ourselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I just, just wanted to be really clear that if we want, uh, the, if we wanted to do the sidewalks ourselves, we already have a problem, not just that we don't have the equipment, but we would not have enough people. We have to basically Correct. hire another person seasonally for, the, for that kind of work as well. Uh, so you're saying Wayne wouldn't have time to do this? I, I can't answer that without, that's, I don't have that answer. Because, uh, well, I don't know how many hours he puts in when there's a snowstorm, whether still it's done or he does it sp sporadically. He, do, he, he does get compensated. Brian can speak for that. There's a separate compensation for plowing snow now in addition to his um, water department hours. Right, he's doing work on behalf of the town, not the enterprise fund. So, right. well, the water right. department. So it comes out of a different account. Different account. I, you know, there's a possibility. You know, we still have a little bit of time. You could, we could try to rebid it. Um, I don't know. It's that's a gamble, but. Like Brian said, and I agree with him, as far as the sidewalk goes, I don't think we're going to see anything better than that one. Okay. Well, do we want to split it up and and uh, and, and approve the sidewalk? And um, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, get it, take the pulse of, of Wayne. Well, if if we if we redid it, what are we looking at time-wise, Brian? What for for the board would make another decision? What two weeks? Bids would be, we request them for two weeks? We would, yeah, we, we could get responses back in two weeks. And then, and then I guess Keith and I could look at the scope of work and see if we can alter it at all to see if we can reduce costs. Um, 
but I mean, we we have to take a look at it. Well, there's no we to forecast through the day after Thanksgiving. Correct. And we might not have some. <laughs> there might be some sidewalks that need shoveling for that. Yeah, that's the risk we would be taking. And what are the chances that health uh, health staffskies might actually fill out the right forms? I mean, that's really what is being. That's the issue, right? They didn't put it in the right form. Um, yeah, yeah. Their rate yeah. seems to be a lot less. You know, if they're talking about uh, a two to three inch at a rate of one hundred and twenty dollars, then that's uh, heck. And, and there, I, it wasn't clear to me what if that was for the town buildings or if that was for the sidewalks. So there's, I, I understand why you can't really accept this as a, as a bid because it lacks the, the details, but the rates generally do seem to be lower. Yeah, and the question was, is that every two to three inches or is it just, because if it's every two to three inches then we're doubling, or I think we'll see a similar doubling. That's that's what I want a clarification on it. And, and I, right. you know, we, we, we tried to do a sealed bid process this time. So we needed clarification you know, fairly soon for the for the fairness of everybody else. Um, right. And they, they, mm -hmm. they never got back to me. Uh, but if we, I mean, we can accept group two bids, we can reject group one bids, and we can go back to the drawing board and, and try to reach more people. Uh, maybe it, uh, yeah. slightly change scope of work. But and now, then, well, yeah, because now you've seen the baseline of bids. Yeah. Um. And then if we accept these bids and we don't have any budget for it, how do we get budget for it? That's got to be a special town meeting. Um, so the way that the town building account is is set up, if they're, I mean, if I'd have to look at the budget, if so, it's a it's a general expenses account. So if something that we budgeted for is not going to take place, then that money mm -hmm. can be put towards that uh, different use okay. um, as long as it's within that account. But I'd have, I'd have to look in detail into where we are at the account. Mm -hmm. But so, with, with this yeah. amount, we would blow through it in two, right. two storms. So, yeah, so we, we, I mean, we just accepting a bid or not, I sort of feel like I don't know that I'm free to accept either of these bids knowing that we don't have the money in the budget to pay for it, right? Because that isn't us voting to accept a bid sort of a commitment to pay. Um, and we haven't really got that in terms of budget unless we shift around a lot of things. So, so in terms of, so the contract, would, what, we, what we are agreeing to is we're agreeing to the rate um, okay. for these storms. So. If we ran out of money, we could we could say, no thanks, um, we're yeah, out of yeah. money. We can't continue this. We can't. And yeah. in terms of the winter roads account, you can deficit spend a winter roads account, um, right? Without these for are the winter authorization. sidewalks. For the sidewalks, you could <laughs> correct. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. We're, I mean, because they're they're not really roads, are they? But so, it's well, it's a town. I mean, at this point in time, it's a town account. It's not like we're we're dealing with state account state aid or something like that so i mean we have the the flexibility okay. to determine what the winter roads get right. spent on okay so so no. that some somewhere somehow if we decide to accept these bids we can find uh we're not making a commitment to pay for something that we can't pay for again i i, I have no problem of paying for it out of my winter roads account it's just right that Somebody has to be we'll aware that it might force it. me into deficit spending. Okay. Okay. So, Brian, these these two bids are still valid for what? So many days? We asked them to hold them for thirty days. For, th for thirty days. So, yep. in, in, the, in the meantime, if uh, you and Keith get together and change the scope of either of these bids, we can advertise with that new scope and still retain these bids for 30 days and see what we get when you change the scope. Isn't that possible? And if, if you change the scope and it comes really different, we can still 
go back to these two bids because we haven't uh, rejected them yet within that 30 day period. And 30 days ends when? Well, from the um, 16th when you started, right? Monday. They were due. Yeah, you're correct. They were, they were, they were due the 16th. Um, I'm just trying to think how I'd have to, I'd have to check on that. Um, if you change the scope, I would think you could, you could, you could rebid with, without rejecting these. That's the question, I guess. I, I guess you probably could. Um, how much, how much, if you find, Brian, if you find out that we really technically should reject that bid, uh, I mean, other than having to call a special select board meeting just to make a formal vote, that would be, could be done. Right. That could be done. Yeah. Uh, I was just trying to think about the fairness aspect of it because now. Yeah. This right. is out there. Um, right. Well, do we want to punt this for a couple of weeks? Because we're not making any headway right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think if we want to table this, um, I guess, Keith, we would need some, we need to come up with some type of contingency plan if we get three feet of snow on December 1st. Um, Maybe we can all pitch in and get it done or something. Yep. I'm down with my little shovel. Okay. Well, we'll call a special select board meeting at the town hall. If, there we go. if we have to, if, if all of a sudden there's a, a forecast for, you know, six inches a foot of snow, then we'll have a special town and we'll have a special select board meeting. We'll yeah. call it quickly. Okay. But we might not have anybody to hire. <laughs> right. Right. That's the thing. Um, yeah, so I guess to, if I had to summarize the way I feel about it, um, we're not going to get a deal as good as we got with Bill Smith. Um, right. We're going to have to pay more than we've budgeted, even if we decide not to do the sidewalks at all, right? Because that's still on the table. We could just decide not to do the sidewalks this year and to, you know, bite that bullet next year. Um, we're, we're still looking at paying a heck of a lot more than we're accustomed to. And I don't know where the fairness comes in. I know about, you know, we, we did get something from uh, the, the one other company. And if they, I mean, is it is it fair to say, hey, put this on the right form so we can make a comparison. Is that really fair that he gets to do that uh, when other people got their stuff in on time and now their bid is public information. So I, I don't know how realistic it is to think that we're going to get a, a better bid. What would, so to me, what I hear from Brian is that maybe on the sidewalks, we're not going to get anything better, but we might get something better on the town buildings. And I don't really know how to evaluate that. I I guess since it's it's not as critical the sidewalks be done, I, I think we should just wait till the next meeting and see what Brian and Keith come up with. Well, I, my only concern, yeah, let's wait till the next meeting. My my concern with not doing sidewalks at all is that you know if someone gets hurt because they're walking on 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 the road instead of the sidewalks. Now I understand that was always the case. Yeah, that was always the case, right? Maybe that was shame on us to begin with, but I, I don't know. I don't want someone to get hurt because we decided that we, you know, mm -hmm. we're gonna save a couple of dollars. Um, yeah, but it's like ten thousand dollars that we haven't budgeted. I know. <laughs> so, I, well, so we have a special it's balancing meeting. the two things. So yeah, don't we have to have a special town meeting anyway coming up? I haven't heard of one yet. I don't know for a reason for one. 
We no. don't. We usually have one in the fall. That's why I asked. Yeah. Well, unless unless CPA had a critical project they wanted to fund. Yeah. Okay. okay. COVID. Well, I would go with go. I I, I I go with taking the risk on waiting another week or two to see what Brian and Keith can come up with. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Then we decide right. we'll wait till the next meeting and Brian and Keith work on it and come up with something. Okay. All right. I'd recommend we table the next item. I, I was going to say the same thing. Yes. Okay. Uh, implement a, a winter parking restrictions. I move that we implement our winter parking restrictions for the winter of 2020 to 2021. Second. Okay. And what are the dates of that, Brian? Um, effective immediately through um whatever we did april 1st april 15th 2021 okay, okay uh motion made. okay roll call vote joyce hi jonathan yeah fred yes okay uh review adopt the weightly hazard mitigation plan do we need to act on that or you want to yeah wait? please our um, we would need to act on that I move that we uh, adopt the Waitley 2020 hazard mitigation plan. Second. Okay, any discussion? Comment? Okay, motion. Okay, motion's been made. Uh, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred? Yes. Okay, we're down to uh, town administrator updates. Trade carefully, Brian. So, Fred, there was, and you know what? I apologize. I forgot to I forgot to send out the revised agenda. Um, so the revised agenda has a and Jonathan, this was this was from you uh, to appoint um, Perrine Munier Jones to the Open Space Committee. Yeah. I move we uh, we appoint this person to the Open Space Committee. Perrine <laughs> Munier Jones. Yes. Sec Okay, uh, we'll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay. Um, and then we received a request from the, and this could be, this could call on a town administrator updates, uh, the annual request from the Waitley Snowmobile Club to use the um, DeMaio parking lot. Is that? I uh, move. Can I, can we give permission for them to do that? Okay, sure. Same okay. Yeah. Oh, um, do we need a vote? Uh, sure. I uh, move that we uh, allow the snowmobile club to use the DeMaio parking lot as we have done in the past. Okay, second it. Okay, uh, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Brad, yes. Um, Keith has equipment that he wants to get rid of. Uh, Bandit Chipper and Toro Mower. And we look for the select board to declare that surplus property. I assume he still wants to get rid of it. Okay. Um, Dan, I, no problem with that. Do we need a, a vote on it? Um, yeah. Okay. I move that we declare the Toro mower and the wood chipper to be surplus property. Second. Okay. Roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred, yes. Um, very quickly, Christian Lane Railroad Crossing was fixed. Um, we've gotten, yes. gotten thanks from uh, both neighbors that they appreciate that it's fixed and it's much better. Um, goodness, we don't really want to talk about budget stuff right now. Um, next meeting, we're gonna we need to have our tax classification hearing. I'll send out more information about that. Again, that's whether we adopt a uniform or mix, uh, mixed tax rate. And there's obviously more details about that that I'll send out that uh, the board can look at uh, between this and, and the last meeting. I think forever that we've adopted a uniform tax rate, but it doesn't mean that needs to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 935, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. I move we adjourn. Second. Done. Jonathan. That's the roll call vote, John. Oh. Okay, Jonathan. Yep. Joyce. Aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Thank you. Good night.
Hey, stay safe, everybody. Good night. Good night, Amy. Good night. Good night. Good night.